Welcome, Chairman Zuckett. Good afternoon, Donna. And Commissioner Naranjo, welcome. We are live streaming. I um, just want to make you aware. And I believe we are awaiting Commissioners Moore and Castellanos. Oh, co welcome, Commissioner Castellanos. Hi, Donna. I believe we um, are awaiting Commissioner Moore, and I heard that Commissioner Malcolm will be joining us a little later. I've heard the same thing, and thank you, and we'll give Commissioner Moore a minute or two here. Welcome, Commissioner Moore. All right, Chairman Zuckett, I believe we have everyone we are expecting. Very good. Thank you, Donna. Um, well, let's proceed. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the August 10, 2021 uh, Board of Port Commissioners meeting. I'd ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Donna, you're muted. I'm so sorry. Please respond when I call your name. Commissioner Benelli. Benelli here. Castellanos. Here. Moore. Here. Naranjo. Here. And Zuket. Here. Commissioner Malcolm is excused until he arrives, and Commissioner Lassar is excused on personal business. Thank you very much. And General Counsel, could we please get any report out from closed session? Yes, and the board considered the items in the closed session agenda and, and to action. All right. Uh, that um, I think we had some connectivity issues there, but I believe the report out was that there was no reportable action. If anybody yes, didn't Chairman, that. that's correct, Chairman. Um, um, sorry about the connectivity. There was no reportable action taken, and the board considered the items in the closed session agenda. Very good. Thank you very much. And um, Donna, any non-agenda public comment? We have none. OK, that moves us along to board committee reports, which I believe there are none. Um, and so that brings us to commissioner reports, of which we have a number, beginning with Commissioner Naranjo uh, regarding the AB 617 committee. Commissioner Naranjo. Thank you, Chair. At the July 2021st AB 7 Steering Committee meeting, CARB staff presented an overview of the proposed Advanced Clean Fleet ACF regulation, which includes having 100% zero emission drayage truck operations at intermodal railroads, rail yards, and seaports by 2035. Following the presentation, representatives from the Environmental Health Coalition, the Natural Resources Defense Council, and the Union of Concerned Scientists asked the steering committee to vote in favor of sending a draft letter on the proposed ACF regulation to the California Air Resources Board. The draft letter recommended supporting the ACF regulation, but requested that ACF regulation go further in some instances. Some examples include 
establishing a mandatory lifetime retirement requirement of diesel trucks after 18 years, requiring fleets to prepare and submit ZEV business transition plans, including charging infrastructure plan to CARB to reduce delays in infrastructure installation, including a 100% ZEV sales mandate across all truck classes by 2035, the draft letter also recommended providing support to ports and air districts that seek to achieve more aggressive truck goals, such as those identified in the Portside Communities AB 617 SERP. I suggested that the draft letter be updated to also reference the Port of San Diego's Maritime Clean Air Strategy. The steering committee agreed and voted to support sending the letter to CARB with my requested modification to reference the port's MCAS. San Diego Air District staff also provided a status update in some of the AB 617 SERP strategies, including the residential air filtration program, which is still under development. Air District staff plans to do additional outreach efforts this fall and to open the program next spring 2022. They are targeting to have the equipment delivered to residents next summer. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Commissioner Ronho. Appreciate that. Commissioner Castellanos. Thank you, Chairman, and good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to report out on a tour uh, that uh, we gave to a um, new city council member uh, from the city of San Diego in District 9, Sean Elo Rivera. Uh, it was a waterside tour. Uh, we spent about two hours on the bay with a, on a Harbor Police Patrol boat. Uh, these tours uh, for our member city uh, elected officials and other local uh, and regional elected officials, they're really, really important uh, so that they can see the wide range of responsibilities and operations and activities that are carried out every day by the Port of San Diego. When we left the Shelter Island Harbor Police Dock, uh, right across the way, we were able to see a port contractor that was replenishing sand at Kellogg Beach. We recently approved uh, that contract. We then went out to the mouth of the San Diego Bay to see an area that uh, our Harbor Police call the zoo, uh, which is the Zuniga Jetty, which is a uh, an area where private boat owners use as a dumping ground for unwanted vessels, uh, derelict vessels, and uh, you know, as you all know, ditch vessels can cause a lot of environmental damage, and they pose navigational hazards for working boats and ships in the channel. Uh, on that day, true to form, there were two recently abandoned vessels at the jetty. Uh, and the council member was surprised to learn that disposing of each abandoned vessel can cost more than $20,000, which can obviously quickly exhaust local and state funding for vessel removal. From the jetty, we headed south to the National City Sweetwater Channel which is a sensitive uh, protected habitat on the south shore of the channel across from the port's aquatic center. Um, on the south side of that channel, I believe that we're actually uh, uh, engaged in a least turn uh, uh, habitat uh, protection site, which is one of our many environmental fund initiatives. We headed back north uh, toward, well, really quick. Uh, we also witnessed there at the aquatic center at the boat launch some South County youth who were receiving some supervised rowing instruction from the hull of a training vessel on the channel. Uh, we then headed north past the um, National City Marine Cargo Terminal. We showed the council member uh, all of the various operations there with respect to our roll on, roll off cargo operations, uh, where we import one out of every eight auto imports into the United States. We passed the uh, Navy Base San Diego. As we headed north, that's home to 54 vessels, making it the second largest naval port in the country behind Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, after passing NASCO, which is the only full service shipyard on the West Coast, we stopped at 10th Avenue Marine Cargo Terminal, where our anchor tenant Dole handles 3.9 billion bananas annually. Uh, that's fruit that's distributed to grocery stores throughout the West Coast and all the way to the Canadian border. We discussed the benefits of shore power at the terminal and our plans to expand our shore power capability there. We then passed the Central Embarcadero, where we pointed out the brand new uh, Ravy Shell at Jacobs Park last week. We had the ribbon cutting for that, where the chairman spoke. Uh, it was a wonderful event, and it's a new cultural treasure for the entire uh, San Diego region. Uh, we also described the Central Embarcadero uh, redevelopment area. Uh, which, if it happens, is a proposed over a billion dollar development. 
We passed next to the uh, USS Midway Museum. It's one of the most successful military military themed museums in the nation with more than a million visitors annually. Uh, near the Midway there in um, uh, the G Street Mall at Tuna Harbor, we took a look at our small uh, silver barge, our Flepsy, where one of our Blue Economy Incubator companies is growing juvenile oysters for sale to companies in the Northwest. Uh, we then went uh, over to Harbor Island where we showed uh, the council member the Coastal Lock Tidal Pool armor system with one of uh, another of our Blue Economy Incubator projects, uh, uh, E-Concrete. Uh, we explained how that three-year pilot project is protecting against coastal erosion while sustaining marine life in uh, triangular concrete uh, tide pools. Uh, it's an alternative, innovative, green alternative to the blocky stone riprap that we have traditionally installed at the water's edge. Uh, as you can tell, uh, this tour is uh, provides just a glimpse of why the Port of San Diego is one of the most unique ports in the country. We've all heard the saying that if you've seen one port, you've seen one port, and the Port of San Diego is the rule, not ex the exception to that saying. I want to thank the Harbor Police, Corporal Matt Oakley and Officer Ben Davis for their professionalism in providing clear safety instructions before the tour and for their expert handling of the patrol vessel and for their comments on the challenges and dangers that are part of the patrol work on our bay. Thank you, Chairman. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Awesome report. Um, good stuff. And I always... Uh... 3.9 billion bananas with a B. That's always a shocking number, how many bananas go through this place. Anyway, uh, moving on, uh, Commissioner Castellanos and Benelli, I believe you have a one-two punch on the next item. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, this next report is about uh, Commissioner Benelli and I. We, uh, well, I gave remarks at the Ports Grand Caribe Shoreline Park uh, 25th anniversary celebration. It was uh, Friday, July 30th at the park. Uh, that park is adjacent to the Coronado Cays. Uh, Commissioner Benelli originally had a conflict, um, and so he was able to attend. Um, you know, I really encourage the commissioners whenever you have an opportunity to participate in uh, one of these celebrations at one of our parks or other sites around the Big Bay uh, to to participate because it's really eye-opening and it gives you a real sense of the history of the district and what's been accomplished. This is a really, really special park. It's not one of our regular sort of uh, uh, active recreational parks. It's a uh, sort of nature-themed ecological uh, passive park. So it's meant to uh, protect, preserve uh, our natural habitat, a place to contemplate the environment, uh, something similar and has inspired what we're going to do over at the uh, uh, new Sweetwater Park in on the Chula Vista Bayfront. Um, this was uh, 25 years ago that a group of Coronado residents, uh, the, the Grand Caribe uh, Beautification Project, uh, started working on this park and it's taken a lot of time and effort over the years to bring it to fruition and keep it in the in the condition that it's in. Uh, there's a, a piece of public art there that you can see in the photo. It's called Sheltering Wings, uh, and it's a, a, a great heron uh, bird there uh, sheltering a, a juvenile bird. And the artist there on the left, um, uh, Christopher Sladoff, was there to also speak. And he he uh, spoke about his inspiration for the, the sculpture uh, and how it helped uh, bring his career to where it's at today and, and uh, the, 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 the protection uh, of things that you grow and cultivate and care for uh, and how important that is. And, and that's what that represents. So I, I really had a great time learning all about the history of this park and I'll turn it over to Commissioner Benelli. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you for stepping in. I like it. Like you said, I thought I was going to be on the road. I was able to make it. It was, a, it was a great day for everybody down there. It was a great way to wrap up July as National Parks and Recreation Month. Uh, kudos to the our parks and recreation staff. They did a, a great job. Uh, turnout, um, probably about 120 people. 
uh, not only from Coronado, but from all around the South Bay. Um, Raphael, uh, pun intended, you, your, your remarks knocked it out of the park. We also had Commissioner Emeritus uh, Lou Smith down there joining us, too. It was just a wonderful day, and it shows how the, the port's always trying to strike that balance between the environment, the economy, recreation, and public safety. Um, uh, these types of parks, uh, you know, provide for the health and wellness for our residents and visitors. Uh, they help out with the economy and our environmental conservation efforts, as well as uh, social equity. Uh, it's one of those special treasures around our bay and this particular one that makes the South Bay Wildlife Ref Refuge uh, so important. It also uh, appeals to um, this commissioner's personal interest in the ability to put your toes in the water. It's a great place to bring your paddleboard, your kayak. It's very peaceful. Get out and enjoy the bay. Thank you again to staff for putting on such a remarkable effort. Everybody I talk to in the community really appreciate the efforts and, and, and the turnout. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman Zuckett. Thank you, Commissioner Benelli and Commissioner Castellanos. Great report and thank you for all of that. Um, as Commissioner Castellanos just alluded to, I uh, had the pleasure last week to help participate in the ribbon cutting for the new um, Symphony Shell, and I was joined by Commissioner Castellanos and Commissioner Naranjo, uh, and also Commissioner Emeritus uh, Marshall Merrifield, and it was uh, a fantastic celebration of, uh, of what is now open. There's been a lot of media coverage of it, and perhaps some of you saw some of the opening performances uh, over the weekend, but this is, uh, you know, a partnership with the symphony and the port that has been quite successful um, with a little bit of help from $85 million of, of, of private financing from, uh, from various uh, philanthropists in San Diego. Um, as you can see in the picture, we're joined by uh, Mayor Todd Gloria, uh, a Congress member, uh, Sarah Jacobs, Martha Gilmer, the CEO of the port, and uh, Dave, what is Dave's last name? Uh, Dave Snyder, the chair of the uh, of the symphony. Um, I'd also note that this is obviously an amazing performance venue, but there was a lot of work that was done to, uh, to the broader park, to the Embarcadero Marina uh, Park South. Uh, widened public esplanades, new benches, refurbished basketball courts and restrooms and gazebos and exercise equipment and landscaping. So um, in addition to this to this venue, there was a lot of public improvements done uh, to the entire area. So um, it, if you haven't had a chance to go down and check it out, it is a it is a one of a kind uh, civic treasure now, as Commissioner Castellanos just said. So appreciate also wanted to acknowledge our, our port staff um, and there's a lot of them who had a significant hand in getting this project uh, done and uh, approved and constructed in in fairly record time for uh, for something of this magnitude uh, on the coast in California so thank you very much um, I have to say, I uh, speaking of Commissioner Emeritus, I saw Duki Valderrama's uh, smiling face uh, flash across the screen here a minute ago. I believe he's here to speak on another item, but I just wanted to acknowledge Commissioner Emeritus Duki. Are you there, Duki? Do you want to say hello? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And it's uh, nice to hear all of your voices. I miss you guys, and uh, I will be back later on on the agenda. Thank you. I appreciate the acknowledgement. Thank you, Dukey, and great to hear your voice and, as I say, uh, see your smiling face there briefly. Um, I also failed to acknowledge at the beginning of the meeting um, the obvious, which is we are virtual again after uh, after being in person last month and thinking we'd be in person for, uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, circumstances change, uh, as, as we've all learned over the last 15 months. So, um, will be virtual again until we're not and uh, and we'll figure it out. But um, but it was nice to have one meeting in person with y'all. Uh, with that, uh, next up is the president's report. Uh, Joe, take it away, please. Thank you and good afternoon, uh, chairman and commissioners. 
today, sadly, we begin with a tribute to a much respected longtime port team member, Charlie Starnes. I'm going to pass it over to Paige. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commissioners, President Stuyvesant, and General Counsel Russell, and Paige Scott, Assistant Director of General Services. It's with a heavy heart that I announce the sudden and unexpected passing of one of our longtime employees, Charlie Starn, a beloved member of the General Services Department. Charlie began his career at the port in 2004 as a lead I'm so sorry. As a lead equipment technician, he quickly established a reputation as a person that could be counted on to get things done and was promoted to maintenance supervisor in 2006. Charlie's impact to his teammates and to operations across the port cannot be overstated. Some noteworthy accomplishments include executive leadership awards for individual and team excellence, letters of appreciation from San Diego Port Tenants Association, personal accolades from the local business owners and officials from each of our member cities. But if you ask Charlie about one of his proudest moments at the port, he'd tell you it occurred when his team was recognized as team of the year in 2005. He took great pride in his team's accomplishments. Outside of work, Charlie was involved in motorsport racing since 1982. He built and drove his own race cars until the mid-1990s. He was part of many different record-setting race teams, including his own. Charlie was a member of a top fuel hydro race team in 2013 and won the Lucas Oil Drag Boat Series World Championship that year. He was a devoted husband, father, and grandfather. Charlie will be deeply missed by many. We will hold a memorial service in Charlie's honor at a future date to be determined. We're coordinating with his family and will provide details as soon as they become available. One of Charlie's daughters works at the port in our real estate department, Amber Jensen. We've maintained constant communications with Amber, offering support to the family during this very difficult time. Amber has expressed great appreciation on behalf of the entire Starnes family for the outpouring of love and support received from her port family. If you would please join me in observing a moment of silence as we mourn the loss of Charlie Starnes. On behalf of the port, I extend our deepest condolences to Charlie's wife, Dorothy, and family. Please keep Charlie and his family in your thoughts and prayers. Thank you, Paige, for those heartfelt comments on behalf of Charlie's port family. Shifting gears, uh, throughout the pandemic, the port has kept watch on the COVID situation and its impacts on the port and reacted accordingly. Staff continues to closely monitor current COVID trends. And as the chair mentioned, as a result, we're virtual this meeting and recommendations from federal, state and county officials. All employees have been asked to show proof uh, that they are vaccinated against COVID-19. We are currently requiring all vaccinated employees to wear a mask uh, in the workplace. We are also recommending that all vaccinated employees wear masks while indoors in group settings, as well as in vehicles with multiple occupants. Our next steps after conferring with our labor partners will be to follow the lead of the state of California and require all unvaccinated personnel to get weekly COVID testing. The health and safety of our employees is our number one concern. I would add that the CDC re released a study today which found that 99.99% of vaccinated people who get COVID avoided hospitalization, serious illness, and are, and are death. I cannot strongly encourage you enough to get a vaccination if you have not already done so. 
We have two emerging issues to make you aware of, and I have a quick timing update on the stimulus timeline we discussed at our board retreat. This past Friday, I received a letter from the San Diego County Local Agency Formation Commission, San Diego LAFCO, suggesting that their research indicates that they might have some level of jurisdictional oversight over the district. Given that our boundaries are spelled out by the state legislature and that we have an oversight agency in State Lands Commission, that ensures our uses are consistent with the public trust doctrine, we question whether LAFCO's assertion is correct. Our general counsel's office is working on a response and staff has made the State Lands Commission aware of this issue. We will keep you posted on our discussions. The second issue is a recent contact by the Losan Rail Corridor Agency, which is a joint powers authority that works to increase ridership, revenue, reliability, coordination, and safety on the coastal rail between San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Luis Obispo. They're looking to site a new maintenance facility and have looked at sites adjacent to our marine terminals that involve our land. The land that they are proposing has the potential dis to disrupt several board priorities. Therefore, we have some concerns about their proposals and will be responding in the weeks ahead. Again, we'll keep you informed as those discussions progress. Finally, on stimulus, we had anticipated based on talks with State Lands Commission that we would be submitting our calculations around revenue losses and to see funding approved at the August State Lands Commission board meeting. State Lands recently informed us that they're experiencing additional questions and comments from the Department of Finance, who wants to add restrictions to how eligible ports might spend the money. State Lands is working this, but it has delayed the process. Staff continues to work with State Lands and also with legislatures on how we might help bring this to resolution. State Lands next regular scheduled meeting after August is October 21st. We hope to have a better sense of what requirements might be ahead of our August 23rd stimulus workshop. On January 30th, 2021, the port and our partners submitted an application for a project designation to the U.S. Maritime Administration, MARAD's America Marine Highway Program. I'm pleased to announce that on July 28th, staff were informed that MARAD had approved this designation for the M5 Coastal Connector Project. The port is working with partners in Bellingham, Washington, Reedsport, Oregon, and Caltrans, to develop a service that moves raw lumber and other wood construction materials southbound and empty containers northbound. These cargos will be carried on a barge eliminating 250 lumber truck trips from the Pacific Northwest to Southern California for each barge trip, reducing 87,000 gallons of diesel fuel usage per barge trip and generating jobs for our local ILWU longshoremen. This designation will allow the port and our partners to apply for grant funds for zero emission equipment and infrastructure to expand the service and reduce its costs for our customers. Staff plans to meet with the full project team in person this fall and continue discussions with barge operators that can help us turn this project idea into reality. Staff expects the service to be fully operational in three to five years, and we're in the beginning stages of this exciting effort. Commissioner Castellanos mentioned the sand replenishment at Kellogg Beach and the sex successful completion of that replenishment project. Last month, a total of 2,200 cubic yards of natural sand was placed as part of the port's recurring effort to reclaim this beach and to protect it from erosion. The Port Engineering Construction Department led this project with support from their colleagues in planning and Greenport and development services. As a result of this major maintenance project, approximately 30,000 square feet of beach land was recovered for the public to enjoy. It was designed in-house and came in under budget. Speaking of budget, our fiscal year end tabulation is in progress as we wait for the actual revenues from tenants along with expenses from vendors. We'll have a more updated financial report in September, and that is when our external auditors start their audit fieldwork. We expect our auditors to complete their audit by October and the auditor's opinion issued in November. Consistent with prior years, the final audited financial statements will be reported at the last quarter audit advisory committee meeting, and that will be December 7th. <clears throat> 
I can report that our actual operating revenues are tracking better than revenues for uh, reforecast. Spoiler alert, the good news is that it looks like we will be beating the operating revenue reforecast by about $9.4 million. Sounds funny for me to say, but I'm pleased to report that we're tracking to achieve an approximately $11 million operating budget for FY21, which includes 4 million for the shore power. But that is a significant improvement over the reforecasted budget operating deficit estimate of $18 million that did not include the shore power. And speaking of uh, our outstanding financial team, I'm excited to announce the district was recently awarded again for the seventh consecutive year, a certificate of achievement for excellence in the financial reporting for the district's June 30th, 2020 comprehensive annual financial report. This certificate is the highest form of recognition in governmental accounting and financial reporting, and its attainment represents significant accomplishment by a government and its management. Way to go, Finance Department. Chair, that concludes my report for today. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. Appreciate that. A lot of good information, and I wanted to uh, recognize and say thank you to Paige for that beautiful tribute uh, for Charlie and our sincere condolences to his family and Amber and um, the entire Port family who uh was close with charlie um moving on to district clerk announcements please thank you chairman additional agenda related materials were received by the board after the publication of the agenda for item number 11 file 2021-0284 blue carbon initiatives there are no requested docket changes today thank you Thank you. So no motion is needed on that then. Uh, moving on to approval of the minutes. Could I get a motion and a second, please? I'll move. Second, Benelli. A motion by Commissioner Castiano, second by Commissioner Benelli. Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote when I call your name. Benelli? Benelli, yes. Castellanos? Yes. Moore? Yes. Naranjo? Yes. Zuquet? Yes. Motion passes unanimously with Commissioners Malcolm and Lassar excused. Thank you very much, Adana. Appreciate that. The consent agenda has uh, seven items. Is there any public comment on the consent agenda? We have no public comment. OK. Uh, any commissioner Benelli, wish move a, a uh, motion by motion. Yeah, Benelli, approve the consent agenda. A motion. Thank you. All second, Castellanos. Thank you. I apologize for speaking over you, Commissioner Benelli. So we have a motion by Commissioner Benelli, second by Commissioner Castellanos. Any commissioners wish to comment or pull any items or not? Not hearing any, uh, please call the roll. Thank you, please vote when I call your name. Commissioner Benelli. Benelli, yes. Castellanos? Yes. Moore? Yes. Naranjo? Yes. Zuquet? Yes. Motion passes unanimously with Commissioners Malcolm and Lassar excused. Thank you very much. That brings us to our discussion agenda, uh, which begins with a informational item from the San Diego Bowl Game Association. Um, we'll start with the staff report, please. Good afternoon, Chairman Zuquette, Commissioners, President Stuyvesant, and General Counsel Russell. Today, I am a blue coat standing in support of the red coats. <laughs> You will now receive a brief informational presentation from Bob Bollinger, president of the San Diego Bowl Game Association on the 2021 San Diego Holiday Bowl at Petco Park and bowl related activities. It's anticipated that the new location for the Holiday Bowl at Petco Park will have a positive impact on port tenants, particularly those on and near the Embarcadero. Bob? 
Thank you, Michael. And uh, first, on behalf of uh, San Diego Bowl uh, Game Association CEO, Mark Neville, our board of directors, and the over 150 uh, red coat volunteers. And I, I'm out of San Diego, so I apologize for not having my red coat on, but uh, thank you for that reference. Uh, and uh, we can take a look at the next slide, please. A uh, lot of exciting uh, things happening this year that will make this event uh, and surrounding events, including the parade, uh, San Diego's uh, biggest holiday party. Next slide, please. Okay, if you could advance to the next slide, it would be great. Thank you. Uh, a whole bunch of news this year. Um, first, uh, uh, new matchup, uh, the ACC versus the Pac-12, first time for the ACC. Uh, uh, none of the 15 teams in the ACC have ever been to San Diego for a football game, so we're excited about that. And that uh, that group includes Notre Dame. So lots of exciting possibilities. We have a new venue, as Michael uh, alluded to, at Petco Park. Great venue, USA Today, year after year votes, voted uh, Petco as the best ballpark in America. Um, we've great sidelines, great atmosphere with uh, Park in the Park, Gallagher Square, and it, just, it lends itself to so many possibilities. And it's downtown where the team stay, where the parade is, where we're going to have a huge bowl bash the, the day before. And we see a whole week long of activities uh, downtown. And uh, a new network, not a new family of networks. We've been with, a, with Fox for the past few years, but this year for the first time ever, uh, we'll be on uh, what I call the daddy network on the Fox network. And this will be the first time uh, in the history of the holiday bowl that we've been on a network. Um, so it's a really exciting time to be moving downtown. I want to touch briefly uh, on this slide. It's a, a, it's a whole new organization. Um, we are diversifying uh, and expanding uh, our portfolio of events, all with the single and, and uh, similar uh, purpose uh, to promote tourism and positive economic impact filling up hotels and restaurants in San Diego. And that includes uh, next year, the Trans Transplant Games of America. Either in 2022, uh, certainly in 2023, we're going to host a college basketball tournament, a mini version of um, uh, uh, the Maui Classic or Battle for Atlantis, four teams on Thanksgiving Day and the day after, uh, all from Power Five conferences. Uh, the annual Cal State Games will be uh, hosted by us uh, starting next year. Starting in 2024, we'll put on the State Games of America, and we're going to form a new organization. Uh, Sports San Diego will be the lead group on San Diego sports tourism. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, mark your calendars. Uh, game day, Tuesday, December 8th. That's the, in the perfect window, three days after Christmas, because people normally travel on the 26th and, uh, and book extended stays. Ideal kickoff, five o'clock Pacific time, eight o'clock prime time on the East Coast. We talked about Petco Park, could not be more excited about that. The, the new ACC matchup against the Pac-12, who have always been one of our conferences. And I mentioned the Fox Television Network. Next slide. But of course, for this uh, body and uh, for, for this meeting, the, uh, the main event, and that's the Port of San Diego Holiday Bowl Parade. That will be that morning. So you can imagine a whole day of activities uh, downtown, 10 o'clock start, North Har Harbor Drive, uh, traditional route, uh, will be televised by Valley Sports Regional Networks. And it is the America's largest balloon parade. And how do we know that? Because Mark Neville assigns somebody every year to uh, watch the Macy's Parade and count the balloons, and we always ensure that we have at least one more. Next slide. Okay, next slide, please. It all gets back to our mission statement. Uh, you can go back one. Well, as I mentioned, uh, our, our mission statement is to promote tourism, 
uh, recognizing that San Diego is a premier destination, the mission of the nonprofit San Diego Bowl Game Association, which is a nonprofit, is to generate room nights and tourism during the off-peak and shoulder seasons for the San Diego hotel industry while generating visibility and economic impact for the region by producing the Holiday Bowl and other outstanding events and experiences, including the parade. And uh, I apologize for reading that, but it's, it's worth always reflecting on that verbatim. Next slide. Okay, the final slide. So, uh, exciting times. And uh, we encourage you to go out and attend the parade, buy your tickets when they go on sale in a couple of weeks. And again, on behalf of uh, our entire organization, we so appreciate your support and look forward to many more years of partnership. So, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Um, Donna, do we have any public comment on this? We have no public comment. Great. Well, hey, I just want to say uh, thank you, Bob. This is some this is some big news for uh, for San Diego and for the port in particular. I think the uh, transition to Petco is 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 amazing, um, and we all know that venue as a fantastic place for baseball and concerts. And now it's going to be a fantastic football venue too. My, Michael, I'll comment on that. We have literally sat in, uh, recently in every section with the football arrangement alignment uh, in mind, and there are vers almost every seat is a great seat. And if you can imagine Petco, the field will run from the Padres dugout uh, towards left field, and they will actually take sections out. It's a one-time retrofit that will allow that to happen. And I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, give a shout out to the San Diego Padres, who are, who are great partners in this venture, and it, this would not be happening without them. Yeah, amen to that. And uh, not to get too deep in the weeds, but people may have seen some media coverage. The city council actually had to vote to allow football at this venue because 20 yes. years ago, when it was built, um, they actually put an exclusion for football in there because of the because of a lot of reasons, but the politics of, you know, the Chargers yeah. time and, and all and, kinds and, of things. And Larry, and that is known as the Larry Lucchino clause. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so, and so this is the, this is the, anyway, this, this all coming together is just, is just huge. And if that's the only thing you were announcing this year, that would be big. But as you said, there's a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Yes. But again, I mean, for the port, this is always a, um, an important group of events, um, but now to have it more centric toward downtown and close, very close to the Port, port Tidelands. In fact, across the street from the Port Tidelands, um, you know, this is this is big. Also for our region, uh, tourism, you know, uh, leisure travel between Christmas and New Year's is not exactly at its high point. So this is a real high point for uh, hoteliers and restaurants and other people who rely on that business. So. This is this is just all good, and then of course, I mean, I'm biased, but I think the biggest news is the ACC inclusion. And I I know Bob, you misspoke when you thought about you know how great it'd be to have Notre Dame here. What you meant is Duke football, just the <laughs> absolutely go Blue Devils because all yeah. 70 people on this call know how much how beloved uh, Duke basketball is. But now yeah. you get to maybe have the possibility of a little duke football coming to town so thank, thank you thank you for that shout out i'm at, at a friend's house who is a carolina graduate and my wife went to nc state so it's all acc very good uh but anyway um this is fantastic appreciate all the work of you and your team and um this is an exciting year um any other commissioners interested in complimenting the ACC or Duke. Uh, <laughs> uh, seeing none, Bob, thank you again for your work and for taking thank you very much to provide this update today. And we can't wait to uh, help support everything. All righty. Uh, from football to cannabis, how about that? Uh, next item is uh, uh, item nine, an informational presentation uh, uh, regarding uh, regulations governing cannabis uh, and the potential of Port Tidelands involvement in this. So we'll start with the staff report, please. Thank you and good afternoon, Chairman Zuket, 
Commissioners, President and CEO Stuyvesant, General Counsel Russell. My name is Amy Heim, and I'm your Program Director of Grants and Government Relations. With me today are David Jones, Deputy General Counsel, and Ryan Donald, Department Manager of Real Estate, along with Kyle Tankert from the consulting team at SCI. SCI is an economic consulting firm with more than 36 years of experience in public finance and policy work. We are here today to set the table for you, so to speak, to discuss cannabis as a potential future business on Port Tidelands. This presentation is intended to be Cannabis 101. We won't answer all of your questions today. What we can do is provide you with an overview of the business, the legal opportunities and constraints as we understand them, and an understanding of what other cities, counties, and agencies are doing. In particular, our member cities, state lands, and the Coastal Commission. This is an opportunity for all of us to learn, for the board to ask questions, and for staff to understand if you would like to pursue this further. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate the introduction and good afternoon, commissioners, staff, and the public. Um, so Kyle Tankard, Senior Consultant and Cannabis Business Leader with SEI Consulting Group. So the purpose of today's presentation and discussion is to provide you with an overview of the cannabis industry here in California and to explore the opportunities of the industry uh, to see if it's a, if it fits and aligns with the goals of the the Port of San Diego. Next slide, please. So to start, I want to give a very brief legislative history of cannabis in California, starting with the passage of Proposition 64 uh, by California voters in November of 2016, which legalized the adult use possession and consumption of cannabis in addition to providing the framework for adult use commercial cannabis businesses here in California. Uh, the, the legislation did a number of things like creating the Bureau of Cannabis Control, which is the State Department uh, that oversees cannabis businesses and also imposed state taxes on the sale and cultivation of can cannabis, which I'll go over uh, in a little more detail later. But most importantly, uh, Prop 64 gave local control to municipalities, allowing them to either place a ban on cannabis activity or, or giving them the authority to develop their own regulations to allow commercial cannabis businesses and also locally tax the industry. Next slide. So moving on, here are the main commercial cannabis activities that are currently authorized in the state. We have cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, testing, retail, and micro businesses. Uh, so all cannabis businesses must be licensed by the state and locally permitted prior to operation. Today's discussion will just focus on retail and consumption lounges, but if there's any questions about the other license types, I can answer those at the end. Next slide. So starting with cannabis retail, which is the sale of cannabis goods either through a storefront shop or through a delivery service. So cannabis goods can uh, can only be purchased by adults 21 years and older or by medicinal patients who are 18 or older with a valid physician's recommendation. Um, no underage person is ever allowed on the premise of any uh, commercial cannabis business. Uh, the state has developed extensive security requirements for retail cannabis businesses, and they're re required to have on-site security during operational operational hours, providing uh, you know a, a safe environment for customers to purchase cannabis products. Uh, cannabis retailers can only sell cannabis goods that have first been tested by a state licensed testing facility and prepackaged in child-resistant packaging which ensures the safety and quality of the products that are made available to the public. Next slide. So here are a, a few pictures of some retail locations in California. I'll give you a few seconds to take a look at these. Next slide. So now let's discuss cannabis consumption lounges. So state law currently prohibits the public consumption of cannabis. 
Uh, in addition, many hotels and Air Airbnbs prohibit the consumption of cannabis, which causes problems for tourist-driven tourist destinations like the port, where the public does not have a place to legally consume cannabis, such as their home resident. Um, as a result, the state does allow for the on-site consumption of cannabis in state-licensed cannabis retail stores or micro-businesses, as long as it is locally authorized. Uh, so far, the state has not developed extensive regulations for consumption lounges, but they do require the following, that the access is restricted to those 21 years or older, uh, cannabis consumption cannot be visible from any public or age-restricted area, and the sale and consumption of alcohol and tobacco is prohibited um, on these premises. Next slide. So West Hollywood, San Francisco, Oakland, and Palm Springs, these are some of the cities that uh, currently allow cannabis consumption mm -hmm. lounges in the state. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, most notably is West Hollywood, which awarded 16 consumption lounge licenses in 2019. Uh, the city of West Hollywood uh, encouraged and adopted a model of consumption lounges that combines uh, both cannabis consumption with a kind of a, a restaurant style atmosphere. Next slide. So here are some a look a look into what these uh, uh, consumption lounges look like. I'll give you a few seconds again. Okay, next slide. So let's discuss location considerations. So at the state level, a cannabis business uh, cannot locate within a 600 foot radius of a school, daycare, or youth center. However, a local municipality does have the authority to add additional requirements and buffers from sensitive uses such as parks, churches, residential neighborhoods, et cetera. Um, some of the early adopters of cannabis in the state originally zoned uh, cannabis retailers and other uh, activities into the less desirable commercial and industrial areas, um, often on, uh, um, on the outskirts of the, the city limits and hidden from the public eye, um, primarily due to the negative stigma that surrounded cannabis. But things are starting to change. We're now seeing cities allow cannabis retailers into the more highly trafficked uh, commercial retail zones. Next slide. So let's take a look uh, at what your five member cities are doing in regards to cannabis. So three out of the five cities, Chula Vista, National City, and San Diego, allow almost all cannabis activities. You'll see that they all ban outdoor cultivation, which is kind of consistent with all cities in the state. Coronado has a complete ban on cannabis activity, and then Imperial Beach has allowed for retail and distribution businesses only. Um, out of the five member cities, only National City has allowed for consumption lounges. Next slide. So San, San Diego was the first member city to adopt an ordinance to allow and regulate cannabis in 2017. They currently allow 36 retail locations and 40 production facilities. Uh, cannabis businesses are required to obtain a conditional use permit as well as an annual operating permit prior to, the, to uh, them operating. Um, lastly, the city, uh, city voters approved a cannabis business tax in 2016, which placed an 8% gross receipt tax on all cannabis business types. Um, so in 2018, San Diego brought in roughly 4.8 million in tax revenue. The next year, that figure jumped to 12.6 million. And then in 2020, uh, for the first three quarters, that brought in roughly $12.6 million as well. Uh, the revenue numbers for the fourth quarter were not available, so that's why it wasn't included here. Uh, next slide. So Chula Vista um, adopted their ordinance, ordinance shortly after uh, City of San Diego in 2018. They allow 12 retail locations, 10 cultivation facilities, and have no limits on the number of manufacturing, distribution, and testing facilities. Uh, because the city placed a cap on the number of retail and cultivation facilities, 
they developed a merit-based selection process to award their permits to the top scoring applicants. Uh, Chula Vista taxes cultivation businesses at $15 per square foot and 7% gross receipts on all the other business types. Uh, their first retail store opened earlier this year, um, so tax revenues were not readily available. Next slide. So National City just recently approved their cannabis ordinance in May of this year. Uh, they are only allowing a total of six cannabis businesses citywide. Uh, they're currently in the process of developing uh, their application procedures uh, that will outline how the city will award their six permits. And as I previously mentioned, Nas National City is also allowing consumption lounges, uh, something that San Diego and Chula Vista do not allow. Uh, so the, the city does not have a voter approved tax in place and instead they're going to require businesses to enter into uh, individual development agreements with the city. Next slide. So next I want to discuss uh, uh, cannabis taxation and revenue options. So starting at the state level, cannabis cultivation is taxed at $9.65 per dry weight ounce of cannabis flour that is produced and then there is also a 15% excise tax imposed on uh, retail purchasers of cannabis. Uh, next slide. As I, uh, as I previously mentioned, Prop 64 allowed for local taxation. So most of all cities that have allowed for cannabis in the state have implemented a local tax measure in order to generate revenue. Uh, the, the two most common methods are either through voter approved cannabis business tax taxes or through development agreements such as National City. Um, the tax rates really vary from place to place, but they can range anywhere from 1% to 15% gross receipts. Uh, the, the early adopters of uh, cannabis uh, uh, implemented rates in the 10 to 15% range, but soon learned that these rates were a little too high and not really sustainable for the cannabis industry. Uh, so many have chose to reduce their tax rates. So we're uh, now seeing uh, new tax measures come in around the, the five to 8% range. Next slide. So what do the revenue options look like for the Port of San Diego? Um, so, so we understand that the Port does not receive ad valorem tax in the Thailands and instead generates their revenue from ground leasing and percentage rent rents. Um, so should the port uh, consider cannabis, you know, this is a great structure to provide revenue uh, or to get revenue from these uh, businesses. Um, so some things to consider are that uh, cannabis is uh, already taxed at the state and local level. In addition, there are fee, uh, high fees as well as annual fees associated with uh, getting licensed by the state and also permitted locally. So it is very important to uh, establish a percentage or, or a rate that is sustainable and really strikes a balance between the cannabis industry, but also meets the goals of the port. So next slide. So this is a, a revenue projection scenario just to give you a glimpse of what this may look like. Um, so the average annual revenue for a retail cannabis business varies up and down the state from city to city. Uh, th the factors that play into this include population size, tourism in the area, the number of retail locations, and also whether there is outside competition from uh, nearby cities or counties that may have uh, cannabis re retail stores as well. Uh, with that being said, the average retail revenues range anywhere from one to four million. There are some outliers where, you know, uh, annual revenue could be as high as, you know, 10, 15 million. So this table below uses the one to four million revenue range and also assumes a, uh, a rent percentage of between three and seven percent. Um, I would like to uh, point out that these aren't intended to be uh, recommended rates and, you know, uh, uh, rates should be established through benchmarking con consultation and consideration of the uh, factors that I previously mentioned. 
And so as you can see in the chart, you know, went through uh, low, high, low, mid and high examples at three, five and seven percent. So you could see what the rent revenue would look at, look like at uh, those different rates. So next slide. So uh, banking in the cannabis industry uh, remains an issue today um, due to the fact that cannabis is federally illegal. Most banks will will not work with cannabis businesses. Uh, as a result, the cannabis industry is primarily a cash based business. Um, while some cannabis businesses have had some success securing banking through uh, regional banks, credit unions, the fees associated with this are usually high and the service is minimal. Um, however, there has been some effort um, and there's some hope on the horizon with the Safe Banking Act of 2021 which passed in the House earlier this year, which would no longer make uh, cannabis sales illegal and would give these business businesses access to banking. Next slide. So this is my last slide before I turn it over to David for a few words. Um, so we have the question, are landlords at risk of losing federal grant money when leasing to a cannabis operator? Um, this is a great question and definitely needs some further research. But in our experience, experience working up and down the state with cities and counties, we have not heard of them losing their ability to apply for federal grants. I know this is slightly different than a landlord, um, but is something that can definitely be researched further. Um, another potential issue in the cannabis industry is the fact that leases often require compliance with federal, state, and local laws. Again, due to cannabis being federally illegal, um, a lease requiring compliance with federal law may or will conflict with a cannabis use. Um, so in conclusion, you know, based on our research so far, uh, allowing cannabis uses on Port District Thailands uh, remains a gray area in the state. Uh, we're not aware of any operational cannabis businesses on state grant, uh, granted Thailands. At the moment, um, the Port of San Diego has considered a few cannabis businesses, but ult ultimately nothing has materialized out of this. Um, so this is uh, something we'll continue uh, to research uh, should this be the direction of uh, the board um, and uh, the direction you would like us to take. Um, so at this point, I will turn it over to David for a few words on the last slide, and then we can open up uh, this conversation to uh, questions and answers. Thanks very much, Kyle, and good afternoon, con Commissioners. David Jones from the General Counsel's Office for the record. Uh, we just wanted to note a couple of additional legal issues that are specific to the district before concluding the presentation. First, uh, District Ordinance 2847 went into effect in 2016, and it prohibits the cultivation of cannabis on tidelands. However, the ordinance is also intended to preempt any local member city regulation of cannabis on tidelands. Thus, via the preemption and despite member cities enacting cannabis related ordinances, we don't currently have a legal framework that authorizes the manufacture, sale, or consumption of cannabis on tidelands. Uh, secondly, for any cannabis related business, being considered on Tidelands, if something were to be considered, we would recommend confirming with the California State Lands Commission whether the operator's proposed use complied with the public trust doctrine. And based on information that we've received to date, State Lands has declined to take a position whether cannabis-related uses are actually trust compliant. They could possibly be waiting for guidance from the governor, California governor, or the leg legislator, but in the meantime, uh, whether cannabis related use is trust compliant is admittedly unclear. Um, we believe in any case, we would likely be limited to retail stores, consumption lounges, or cannabis related events uh, based on the visitor serving elements of, of those types of uses. So that concludes the presentation and we're happy to discuss and answer questions. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, David and Kyle. Um, Donna, do we have any public speakers on this item? Yes, we have four live commenters and one voicemail. Sure. We'll start with the voicemail, 
voicemail from Mayor Sotelo Solis. Hi, this is uh, Mayor Sotelo Solis from the city of National City. Hello, uh, commissioners. Uh, this is on item nine, the informational uh, item regarding cannabis sale on port property. National City has been working really hard over the past several years to create a cannabis ordinance and a process and policy that is right for National City. The City Council adopted an ordinance recently and is finalizing the permit process so we can begin accepting applications by the end of the year. Getting this right for the port will be different for every member city. We sat us as the city of National City has sat through years of workshops where we've listened to all points of view and we are doing what is right for us. We would like the Port District to be our partner in these efforts and encourage you to utilize our efforts to date. National City has approved up to three consumption lounges in the commercial tourist zone within National City's Marina District. This would be allowed both on port and city land. We will be the first city in San Diego County to allow on-site consumption, and it will only be the fourth city in the state alongside Oakland, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. As a leader in this emerging industry, National City has taken every necessary step to ensure that any future consumption lounge in the Marina District fits with its fabric, culture, and mission outlined within the balance plan. Again, this is all in order to develop a local, regional, and even national draw. In order to ensure the safety of our community and those who travel to visit our consumption lounges, there have been strict regulations put in place. Consumption lounges cannot serve alcohol and they will prohibit access to persons under 21. Consumption lounges, lounge employers will also be required to provide employee training and customer education about the various products provided, including their potency, absorption time, and effects. This is an effort to ensure responsible consumption. Consumption lounge businesses will also be required to develop and submit an anti-drug driving plan to the city, as well as community liaison official who will meet with the city staff and regularly address community concerns or complaints. Consumption lounges have been identified and advocated for, for them by, by the Minority Cannabis Business Association, who has it as one of their top 10 model municipal so social equity ordinances. For many in our community that where over two thirds are renters, the consumption of cannabis, even for medical purposes, is prohibited in their homes. Consumption lounges provide a safe and legal space for our community to consume. National City hopes to be a resource to the port in your consideration to allow cannabis on port Thailand. The city in its analysis also believes we could serve as a pilot city as you develop your program and would like to set up time to discuss the necessary steps to do so. Making the balanced plan a reality will make and take creative ideas and hard work. We are prepared to stand together with you and make this a positive part of our plan. Thank you so much. And that concludes my comments for item nine. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have live comments. Uh, first is from National City Vice Mayor Rodriguez. Vice Mayor, are you uh, you may be muted. Good afternoon, Port Commissioners. I am Jose Rodriguez, the Vice Mayor of National City, and I wanted to express my gratitude for your willingness to listen and to, to discuss the sale and consumption of cannabis on Port District sidelines. As you know, we in National City have gone through a two-year process of evaluating, publicly discussing, drafting, and ultimately supporting a cannabis ordinance. We see this as an opportunity to maximize our very limited land. We envision taxation from cannabis sales as a steady revenue stream in hopes to diversify our tax base. I understand there are some reservations regarding a historically illicit drug, but the truth is that it is now legalized. We as Californians supported Prop 64 in 2016. San Diego citizens uh, supported Prop 64 by 61%. Chula Vista citizens supported it by 52 percent. 
Imperial Beach citizens supported it by 62 percent. It was, in fact, national cities whose voters were split on the issue, being decided by 11 votes against the measure. Knowing full well the historical opposition in our own neighborhoods, we held uh, town hall forums, asked for feedback on social media, held a series of discussions earlier this year um, before deciding to move forward with the ordinance. As you make this decision, I hope that you take into consideration the considerable work uh, our city staff, community, and elected officials have done in preparation to legalization of the industry within our city. I ask that you please support the sale and consumption of cannabis on Portland. It will assist our city in multiple ways. Thank you again. Thank you. And now we have Commissioner Emeritus Duki Valderrama. Well, thank you very much, Donna. Uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's my honor to be able to come back and, and uh, speak to my fellow uh, ex-commissioners. Uh, uh, and so anyway, on this particular issue, I support the position taken by, by the mayor and the vice mayor. Uh, I indicated when I spoke in front of the council, when the council was facing budgetary deficits, that one of the options that should be considered was uh, pursuing the cannabis uh, to get into the cannabis industry, uh, because I felt that there was uh, a way to be able to short uh, fill in the gap on, on the deficit. It wouldn't take care of all the deficit, but that was a step in the right direction. Um, my wife has been a medicinal user uh, under doc doctor supervision for 10 years because of medical related issues. And so I've always been a strong supporter of, of the cannabis industry. Uh, and as and as, as Jose indicated, the vice mayor has indicated, it has been approved. Uh, Prop 64 has put it put it into that position. What the city of Nash City is uh, attempting to do is utilize uh, some potential port lands uh, for the uh, consumption lots. But right now, uh, that would not be possible with with Port Ordinance 2847, which prohibits. Uh, any kind of cannabis related business on, on district property. So uh, my recommendation to the commissioners would be to direct staff to repeal uh, Port District Ordinance 2847 uh, because it's really, uh, it, it's now been approved by, by law. And at that time I was on the commission when we voted on it, we, we took the very safe conservative position that let's stay off, let's stay away from this. But now we've seen that it's not the it, it, it is actually a very good business model to be able to move forward. So I would recommend that the commissioners repeal Port Ordinance 2847, number one. Number two, that uh, we keep uh, working with California state lands to, to get a definite uh, decision regarding uh, whether this is available, uh, something that can be done on Port Thailand. So my, 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 my full recommendation is to move forward, to do whatever steps we have. There's a lot of steps that we have to pursue, but the first one be, would be to repeal 2847 to make sure, and then also make sure that we're in compliance with, with all federal laws moving forward. So it's been my honor to be able to come back and speak to, to you. One of these days, I'd like to be able to uh, come by and see you guys all personally, but until we get over COVID, I think that we're, that's going to have to wait. So it's been my honor to be able to come back and speak to you today. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. And now we have Laura Wilkinson Sinton. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to hear Dookie's voice, too. Uh, my name is Laura Wilkinson Sinton. Um, I chair a committee for the National Cannabis Industry Association. I also serve on the board of the South County Economic Development Council. I've been in the cannabis business since about 2016. And I'm also a consumer of many of those 3.9 billion bananas that pass through the port and walk my dog daily at Grand Caribe Shoreline Park. So thank you for all you do for my personal quality of life. Um, a couple of quick statistics here. The latest Pew Research poll released in April 2021 showed 91% of American adults think cannabis should be legal and accessible to those who need it. And by 2025, cannabis will be a $43 billion legal market. Uh, currently, $8 billion is illegal market in the state of California. So I strongly encourage the commissioners to allow cannabis retail outlets and also um, 
build upon national cities work when it comes to lounges too, especially with such a big tourism population. That way you can make sure that the tourists are in supervised and cordoned off areas should they take to imbibe. San Diego County is really far behind the rest of California and other states in their licensing of retail, and that is fueling the dangerous and illicit markets that are thriving here. And your commercial entities, um, everything from the Ferry Landing, Seaport Village, Bayfront, National City, all of them would benefit greatly, the tenant groups would, from the increased traffic and tourism traffic, but they will likely need education and information on how these actually work in these situations. I strongly encourage you to speak to the commissioners at the Port of Oakland and the Port of San Francisco on their policies, which they already license cannabis retail on their port properties. And their leases and policies are meant to facilitate commerce for their tenants um, at their ports. And not they have chosen not to put an additional onerous letter, layer of regulation on top of the state and local regulations that happen as well. Um, one of the problems you may have with a percentage-based lease, it makes you a party to the license in the eyes of the state of California and even in national cities ordinance. It makes you a real party in interest, so you have a vested interest in the success of the cannabis business. So that may be something to consider from a legal standpoint, too. Um, your tenants, no question, have suffered economically during this pandemic, and this would bring an economic benefit to your member port cities as well with the additional commerce and revenues. To those who have preconceived notions of what cannabis dispensaries really are, there's a tremendous amount of science-based data that shows reduced crime due to the security requirements, improved property values due to safe regulated access as the voters asked for, and the youth prevention programs are really working. Teen use is actually down in legal states. And those of you concerned about the Navy, Directive 1315 from the VA allows Navy veterans to speak with their doctors about cannabis for PTSD and pain without fear of losing their VA benefits. So everybody is coming to this and cannabis commerce is now deemed essential by the state and by the 38 other states that have legalized it in the United States. I strongly believe that the county and the port district and port lands and the member cities would all benefit if the port chooses to plan for the future here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we have Maribel McKenzie. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Port of Commissioners and uh, everybody here uh, on here. My name is Maribel McKenzie. I'm the organizer and political director with United Food and Commercial Workers. I'll start off with providing my information just in case anybody would like to follow up with me. Uh, my email is mmckenzie at usbw135.com. Uh, once again, it's M-M-C-K-I-N-Z-E at USCW135.com. And uh, my name is Maribel, once again, and I uh, work as the organizer and political director with United Food and Commercial Workers. We represent a little bit over 13,000 essential workers that consist of retail, grocery workers, drugstore workers that uh, include Ralph Bonds, Albertsons, Theta Brothers, Food for Less, Rite Aids, and CVSs. We also represent within the medical industry at Kaiser Permanente, we have the pharmacy inpatient and outpatient. And in the manufacturing uh, sugar plants, we represent in Imperial Valley, Spreckle Sugar. And we also represent the cannabis industry. That's everything that consists from seed to sell. Um, as we're dealing with COVID, it's uh, one thing that I definitely want to acknowledge our members. It's been difficult, and I want to make sure that we acknowledge that They've provided service throughout this whole uh, COVID time, and they've been facilitating not only vaccinations, but their um, services to the public. Um, but the main thing that this one is about is about cannabis. And as we're going into the cannabis, um, we are the union that represents anything from seed to sell. And uh, within the cannabis industries, and especially here in California, any of the companies that come in and they're trying to operate the businesses here, they would have to sign an LPA, which is a labor peace agreement. Um, that And that would be a, an essential contract between the employer and the organizing labor, uh, where they're allowing um, the union to come in and speak to the workers and provide a copy of the employees that are there. The company, once the LPA is signed, has agreed to be neutral, not go for it or against it, allowing the union to go in. 
And as the unions go in, they definitely look into what's best for the communities and partner up with companies to create uh, livable wages and reach out and do what's best for the community. Um, the cannabis industry is, is definitely emerging, emerging and it's growing fast. And some of the stigmas that uh, we need to make sure that we, we properly defy the stigmas that surround it. Um, before there was a lot of illegal operations and unfortunately there's still some out there that exploit employees and uh, there's plenty of horrendous stories that we have and have heard from a lot of the members that we currently represent. Um, and in order for that to go on board, we want to make sure that we're continuing to protect the workers and uh, that there's a lot of community involvement and also education for the, for, for the not only the community, but even as the industry continues to grow. Um, some of the other things that we've, uh, a good thing that uh, I could say that we've had and we've created just recently, we uh, represent March and Ash, which is the cannabis industry and they are looking into growing and they're growing pretty fast and they're all here locally in San Diego. Uh, some of the things that we were able to include in our partnership and that we were able to create and increase the standards within the industry is daycare funds, education funds, livable wages, and we also added on a JLM, uh, which is a joint uh, labor management agreement, where not only does it consist of, or would it consist of just March and Ash, but other cannabis industries and doing what's best for not only the community, but also even as the industry keeps on growing within education and making sure that there is a experts a data, making sure that the data is taken care of properly and uh, as they're growing within different communities that the community is also served properly. Um, and as a creation of this is, I understand this is just a hearing, this is not an ordinance, but I definitely encourage this to move forward. And as the cannabis is here and, and it's continuing to grow everywhere, um, we have to be intelligent to make sure that we're adapting and that we can pose to the problems to our communities and build on this together. Not only um, as we're continuing to work uh, as labor with communities. We're also working with groups that do a lot of prevention. Uh, let's make sure that we work on this together and for this to move forward. I recommend for this to go forward and encourage uh, our um, Port of Commissioners to please adopt this. Uh, we're definitely creating good jobs, creating livable wages, and making sure that there's good pol political coverage and gather good revenue for the Port of San Diego. And this concludes my comment. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Malcolm. Thank you, Chair Zuket. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the speakers and the uh, presenters. Um, and it was really nice, Dookie, to hear your voice again. So um, I didn't get to see you, but it was it's always nice to hear your voice. And one of these days you'll be in front of us uh, on some topic or another, I'm sure. Um, so I wanna say at the outset that um, my comments um, are in no way to be construed as comments for or against cannabis, the industry, the business model, which I acknowledge uh, is a very good business model. Um, I happen to know the Marsh and Ash people. Um, they are the winners of the Imperial Beach Lottery. They're actually building their store right now in Imperial Beach, and it's going to be a very phenomenal structure. Um, and uh, they are very, very good operators. I know them. Um, nor uh, do, uh, do I want my comments to be construed as um, against or limiting anything any one of our member cities can do. And I acknowledge the fact that member cities have spent a lot of time studying the issue and studying the, the, the ordinance and coming up with ordinances that work for them and their municipalities. Um, you know, nor would I want anything to get in the way of what those cities may be able to do in their cities, uh, promulgating their rules uh, for various businesses, marijuana included. Having said all of that um, disclaimer, um, I am speaking purely as a port commissioner and a trustee of state tidelands. And in that capacity, um, I do have some issues and I have some concerns. 
with regard to marijuana coming to Port Tidelands is an allowed use. Um, and I first want to address the use issue, and then I want to address the legality issue. Um, you know, first the use issue, um, the consultant started off talking about Prop 64 that allowed municipalities to promulgate rules uh, uh, about cannabis, whether to allow or disallow cannabis within city limits. Um, and that's interesting. However, I would point out that municipalities operate under a completely different part of the Coastal Act. They operate under Chapter 3. They are not subject to the Public Trust Doctrine. Um, the Port of San Diego operates under Chapter 8 of the Coastal Act, and we are subject to the Public Trust Doctrine, um, which, which puts different rules on the Port of San Diego in terms of what businesses we can allow on Port Tidelands. Um, you know, it's interesting to note, you, you go back in time, and it's a little bit curious for me that this item is coming up, because I don't believe in my time as a port commissioner, I've ever had or seen an item on one particular use, you know, whether it would be allowed or disallowed. Um, and, and in this case, um, I, I would say, I, I would talk about the past, um, and, and some of you that have been with the port a long time may remember this, back in the day, um, when Karamar was first talking about the old police headquarters um, and talking about some of the uses they wanted to put in. And two of the uses, uh, and for those that, that have been here a while, you'll remember this, they wanted to put in a Whole Foods market and they wanted to put in a CVS drugstore. And um, that never actually made it to the port board. It did make it up to state lands and state lands, you know, kind of gave a negative, nah, grocery stores, drug stores, you, you know, not allowable uses under the public trust doctrine and not allowable uses on, on state land, you know, and, and I remember at the time I went to a port commissioner that will remain nameless. And I said, why wouldn't you push, you know, these uses? I mean, certainly there were 7,000 hotel rooms, you, you know, in the area. Certainly those people eat foods, they would go to the deli, they have, they would want vitamins, you know, th th this, these uses that they need their prescriptions filled, these uses would certainly, you know, be public trust compliant visitor oh. serving and the visitors would need to go and use Whole Foods, you, you know, go to CVS for, for drugs or for various different sundries. Uh, and it was just, you, you know, I, I could not understand why it was not pushed more. Now, I bring that story up to make a point that unless state lands has radically changed, you know, what they consider to be compliant, a compliant land use under the public trust doctrine, um, I just can't see where a cannabis use would be allowed, but a Whole Foods, a CVS, um, a gym, um, you know, other things that you could make a very, very strong argument that visitors to Port Tidelands, either coming for the day or staying in hotels or coming to conventions, you know, would also not use those facilities. And to me, why it's curious to me that this that this is coming up is that, you know, I think really what we should be having is a much larger discussion. I mean, let's talk about cannabis, but let's talk about, you know, other larger uses that we can put on Tidelands, um, you know, because, for example, we've got 40 acres uh, across the street over at um, Harbor Island. Um, you know, we used to have $3 million of, of revenue coming there from rental cars. That's gone. You know, we have not been able to replace that revenue. And to the extent that we can come up with uses, you, you know, that are some of these bigger uses, we could actually include that into an RFP to have developers propose. So to me, because 100% of port revenue comes from rent, 60% from real estate rent, this is a really, really important topic, but it should be expanded well beyond cannabis, you know, to, to other uses and whether or not they're compliant under public trust and allowable by state land. So, you know, that's my first comment. If we're going to use, if we're going to use more time for this, let's use it to have a very fulsome and complete discussion. Um, my second issue and, and my real concern here is um, notwithstanding whether state lands would say yes or no on cannabis, um, I have heard rumors 
that uh, there are some cannabis businesses that have proposed uh, or wanted to propose to go into Seaport Village. Um, now, um, as the consultant kind of talked about, uh, but I'm going to put in much more sharp relief, cannabis is illegal um, under the Controlled, Controlled Substance Act, which is Title 21, Section 811 of the U.S. Code. Um, it, it remains illegal. And what really concerns me greatly and what is different between the Port of San Diego and a city is cities are promulgating rules for a use to be allowed on a private fee piece of property, not owned by the city, owned by a private individual to enter into a lease. And that person is taking the, the risk, you know, under a lease. In this case, the Port of San Diego who annually gets millions of dollars of grants from the federal government, who recent, as recently as four years ago got a Tiger grant for $10 million, and we apply for grants all the time. And part of grants is that uh, you know we're compliant under all federal law. The prospect here is that the Port of San Diego, as a government entity, could enter into a lease on government land for a use that is illegal by federal government. And, and that to me is one commissioner is totally unacceptable. Um, there is no way as the law stands now, and I appreciate um, you know, um, our consultant saying that you know, there's legislation out there that may change that, Th that's all well and good. But today, it is an illegal use, and to the extent that we put a tenant in, we would be signing a lease for an illegal federal use. And I just cannot see, as a trustee of Port Tidelands, how how I could ever get myself there, how, how we could do that as an organization. I acknowledge my fellow commissioners might have a totally different take on this, um, but that's where I stand. And certainly I would be, I would hasten to add that if um, this became if it became not illegal, not a controlled substance, not a schedule one drug um, at the federal level, I would immediately withdraw that objection. But as it stand, stands right now, um, to me, that is a huge, huge stumbling block, notwithstanding what state lands may or may not find. Um, you know, but, but again, and just to conclude, um, you know, because I heard a lot of people talk about jobs around the tide land, I want to tell you I, I, that uh, that is my, you know, one of my real passions for the port. We have 33,000 jobs around Tidelands. I would love to expand that and get more and get in quality uses, um, you, you know. And so to me, again, I think that this is a larger conversation about, you know, what uses, what are the boundaries, you know, for what we can put on Tidelands. And, you know, and, and in that respect, this is a very um, you know, helpful discussion, but I hope this discussion continues. But, you know, in terms of marijuana right now, given the legal framework, um, I would have to object as one commissioner. Um, thank you very much, Sherry. Thank you, Commissioner Malcolm. Um, commissioner Naranjo. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the public speakers that spoke on this agenda item. I want to thank Laura, resident from Coronado. I want to thank Maribel McKenzie from United Food and Commercial Workers Local 135. And specifically, I want to acknowledge the leadership of my member city, Mayor Alejandro Sotelo Solis, Vice Mayor Jose Rodriguez, and my own predecessor, Emeritus Commissioner Duque Valderrama. There are numerous studies that unveil that the prohibition of cannabis has only prompted the continuation of an illicit market that endangers our health and public safety. Let's not forget the racist attitudes within the historic criminalization laws where the war on drugs was really a front to continue the mass incarceration of folks of color. At the Port of San Diego, we are committed to a 21st century port with the vision that states, we are an innovative global seaport courageously supporting commerce, community, and environment. I, I think it is time that we move to become the courageous 21st century port where we not only repeal the prohibition ordinance 2847 that's on our books, but also continue, consider bringing back to the board a strong cannabis ordinance that can follow with respect to where our member cities are at on this issue and that incorporates a lens of one, social equity, two, labor, three, community. As other municipalities, cities, counties, 
and port like the Port of Oakland across the state and our nation have adopted their own cannabis ordinance, we know for sure that there has been a positive benefit of revenue growth and oversight on a market that, again, has proven to be problematic when it's not regulated. Plus, this was an industry that was allowed to continue under a shutdown, so we know that adding this to our business portfolio, we have a chance to allow a new and thriving growing industry that is deemed essential. For the social equity component, there is not a perfect social equity formula in cannabis, but there are many models that the Port of San Diego can look into. I highly recommend that the Port staff can look into the models adopted in Coachella, Michigan, Chicago, New Jersey, New York, Georgia, also to look into the cannabis equity incubator programs of San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Oakland. This would be a great opportunity for port staff to research and look into the lessons learned and help develop an equity program that can help us to win state funding. Just how Coachella won two straight grants totaling $1 million. Within the social equity lens, we can look into events licensing to help black, indigenous, people of color folks in hosting events on Thailand's. There are great templates done by the Minority Cannabis Business Association that we should consider looking into. And as for labor, According to the Leafly 2021 jobs report, legal cannabis generated 321,000 full-time jobs. Job creation is key to help us recover economically from this pandemic-induced recession, but it's not just about jobs. It's about good jobs. It is important that we look into the ordinances that incorporates labor peace language with collective uh, bargaining agreement bonus points in a merit-based application system. Also support apprenticeship programs to hire those that were formerly incarcerated and, guide, and by giving them a second chance to have a career in a thriving, growing, essential industry. And last but not least, community. To always ensure the community that we at the Port of San Diego are transparent and that we're permitting good cannabis business on our Thailands, Port staff can look into how other municipalities have used A, community advisory councils, B, incorporation of whistleblower protections, C, incorporation of revolving door prohibitions, and D, report on updated audits and compliance. At this onset, we are in a good position to evaluate what has worked, what hasn't worked, and most importantly, create an ordinance that is unique and valuable economically for our port. But of course, before moving into creating an innovative ordinance, I would like to motion the repeal of the prohibition ordinance on our books and look into developing an ordinance assisting our member cities in changing the conversation with our State Lands Commission. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Ranjo. Um, there's a motion by Commissioner Ranjo. Um, uh, does that conclude your comments, Commissioner? Yes, that's the end of my comments. Okay, so my question for the General Counsel is if that motion is, um, if the item as it's been docketed today, if that motion is in order or if we need to uh, notice this discussion differently. If anybody's talking right now, they're on mute. Hi, it's Rebecca Harrington um, with the General Counsel's Office. Unfortunately, I believe Tom is um, computer froze, but it is not agendized for that type of action. If the board wants to do a motion for direction to staff to bring back an item looking at our current ordinance, as well as options for repealing or even amending it, we we can do that. Um, so Commissioner Ranjo, I, I uh, suspected that just based on the, this is an informational presentation from SCI Consulting Group on Regulations Governing Cannabis Sale and Consumption on District Tidelands. And so for the board to take action on repealing an ordinance, I think it would need to be more a more explicit um, noticing with respect to what Rebecca just said, um, you are welcome uh, to motion to direct staff to prepare such an ordinance to bring it back to the board's consideration or something along those lines. And if you're interested in going down that road, I believe that would be in order. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd like to amend my motion to uh, 
for staff to bring back what um, the repeal will look like and for the board's consideration. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Rebecca, that, that's in order, I assume? Yes, sir, that's in order. Okay, thank you. Is there a second to that motion? Um, I'll second it for the purposes of discussion and we'll move on to Commissioner Moore. Thank you. And um, I don't have an issue with the motion, but I would probably like to see if we can amend it in some fashion um, to include a couple of other things. Um, but before that, I, I just wanted to um, thank all the speakers that came out today. Um, also wanted to just acknowledge uh, Dukey, uh, com uh, uh, Commissioner Amaratis, uh, um, uh, Dukey Valderrama, thank you. It was very nice to uh, hear your voice again. Um, and I wanted to say that I am not against um, having a cannabis ordinance or cannibal use, cannabis uses um, in uh, port property necessarily, but there were a couple of questions um, or issues that had been raised that I think we need to consider. And so that's in, in the vein of, you know, first of all, we need to make sure that we have an answer to the fact that it is um, public trust compliant. Um, and um, so I think that that's important. I also wanted to make sure that we know the answer uh, to the, I think somebody is not muted and it's, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty. Okay, so uh, the other question is, I, I wanted to um, understand um, if there's going to be any impact on any of our grants. And, and I know that it doesn't, as Malcolm pointed out, there is a difference between Port Thailand's and usual um, situations where you're talking about a municipality and um, they're just organized different. The land is usually, it's uh, composed of uh, private property. So there's just some differences that I think it's at least worth making sure that we're not have we're not going to have an issue later with respect to any um, federal grants. Um, and then I think that we also want to be sure that we just maybe don't necessarily just repeal the ordinance. But I want to make sure that each member city's, you know, restrictions are respected. So I do know that some member cities have different restrictions than others. And so I think that I want to make sure that those restrictions are respected in anything that's brought forward uh, to be sure that, you know, that each member city, it, it's that our policies are reflective of uh, obviously the concerns that each member city may have. Um, so I think if we could have uh, something that uh, it, I would be in support of the motion that was made by Commissioner Naranjo, um, if those types of issues were basically incorporated so that when it's brought back that all of those issues were resolved or considered and that the ordinance, that not just the repeal is brought back, but perhaps something an ordinance that is brought back is uh, an ordinance that is respectful of the various different uh, member cities restrictions. And also agree uh, quite a bit with Commissioner Malcolm's uh, discussion about um, issue about having a larger discussion of uses. I think the uses that are allowed on Port Thailand is something that has always been a concern with me myself. and. And um, I think that it's definitely something that we should consider as well. So those are those are my comments. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner Moore. Um, uh, Commissioner uh, Naranjo. Thank you, Chair. I just quickly want to say that I am fine to include uh, uh, in my motion what Commissioner Moore brought forward. So I'm happy with that. All right, so those uh, uh, incorporations suggested by Commissioner Moore will be uh, added to your motion and I and I uh, accept that change. Um, Commissioner Benelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, first of all, let me talk, speak to uh, Commissioner Emeritus Duque Valderrama. Again, echoing everybody else's comments, good to hear your voice, good to hear your voice, Duque. And uh, I want you to know I'm totally supportive of cannabis use for, for medical uses under a doctor's supervision. I'm also supportive of consumption of cannabis in the privacy of on your, on your home, in your own homes. However, on Port Tideland, being a strategic home port, uh, as succinctly as I can put it, no, no, and heck no on Thailand's. Um, I think my city's made itself pretty clear when you look at the matrix, uh, what they think about consumption of, uh, of uh, cannabis along the Thailand. So um, that's where I'm at, and I can see be supportive uh, of uh, Commissioner Narano's uh, uh, motion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner Benelli. Um, can't believe you want this whole thing just to go up and smoke. Um, all right, that's the first of. Uh, no, that's the last. No, no more puns. No more puns. Um, well, I'm high on this. Okay, I lied. Well, not, that was the last pun. Um, so, um, I think. Um, I think Commissioner Malcolm brings up some very important points, some important distinctions between municipalities in the state of California and how the port is um, both statutorily situated, but also our relationship with the federal government is different than municipalities. Um, I think those are uh, very important considerations and may uh, prove to um, be problematic for for this. Uh, I believe based on the motion that's on the floor, those types of things uh, would be analyzed and would be, um, we would get direction or at least advice uh, on that. Uh, so, uh, I think that's, I think those are important questions to answer, and I think they would be in the, in what would come back if this motion passes. Um, with that um, in mind, I mean, I do support, um, you know, California law, which does allow these retail and consumption uses. I support supporting our member cities, um, not not forcing anything on a member city that is not down with this or is not proposing it. But if we have a member city coming to the table, um, we have typically um, embraced and supported the, those, um, those endeavors, unless there was some, you know, separate inherent conflict with the port as a separate entity, which again is Commissioner Malcolm's point um, and Commissioner Benelli's point, so I'm not I'm not skipping over that, but and I think that needs to be addressed. But if it can be addressed, um, you know, I would support the efforts of, in this case, National City, uh, and I appreciate the mayor and vice mayor uh, and the other public speakers who um, who brought that perspective today. Uh, one of the speakers mentioned. Um, the ports of Oakland and San Francisco. If our staff and consultants haven't already, I think that would be a, an important um, uh, data point to see what's going on there and what interaction, if any, they've had uh, with state lands. Um, I agree with Commissioner Malcolm in the sense that um, just because the House of Representatives essentially passed a legalization bill back in April um, most political observers believe that that has absolutely zero chance of passing the United States Senate anytime soon. So, uh, so at present, um, in many ways, this is still a an illegal substance in the eyes of the federal government, and that's uh, and the practical imp impact of that is probably most um, uh, felt in the banking side of this, and so. If you're not allowed to use the banks for your business and how the port would interact with a business that is not allowed to use uh, you know, the federally insured banking system, 
Um, I think that'd be another issue to add to the list of, you know, how do we navigate that? Um, so I, I think these are all important issues. I just, I come at it a little differently than Commissioner Malcolm and Commissioner Benali in that I think it's worth pursuing the answer to those questions and to, and to get those things uh, resolved. And I'm not suggesting that Commissioner Benelli or, or Commissioner Malcolm doesn't want to get those issues resolved, but I support this motion because I think it's worth uh, getting that information uh, back. Um, the city of San Diego has, is generating significant revenue um, with its retail, um, and I believe there's only eight in the city of San Diego. Um, I think it is, um, I, I, I agree with the comments about some of the, you know, former stereotypes of, 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 of this, um, of this substance and of this industry uh, are changing and uh, the port could be a helpful part of that change if it's, um, if it's legal and in our interest to do so. So I, I think it's worth exploring that. Um, so I, I just with respect to repeal of the ordinance, I also, it, it's not clear to me um, whether the motion on the floor is about bringing a new ordinance back, which I think might be a little premature as Commissioner Moore said, if we're gonna affirmatively create an ordinance uh, that might take some more work consultation with member cities. I think the motion was simply to repeal what is currently an ordinance of the port, which is that we won't even look at anything like this. And I think it's a sensible first step to consider repealing that ordinance and then exploring the issues surrounding going further and then um, and then sort of following from there. So those are my uh, comments and Commissioner Benelli, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, another thing, another fact I can consider. If if a majority of my colleagues go ahead with this and direct staff to uh, use resources and their time and expertise, the one thing I'd like to hear from too is our Harbor Police Department. What do they think about the overriding thing of all, all government agencies is public safety. So I'd like to hear some type, not now, but if it goes forward to hear from uh, uh, the Harbor Police Department, what they think uh, would be the advantages and disadvantages from a law enforcement public safety uh, perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Benelli. I think that makes some sense. Uh, Commissioner uh, Naranjo, is that okay to include as direction to staff in your motion? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, Commissioner Moore. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that um, I also wanted to ask, I, I think you've already addressed this, which is this idea that it would be good to get more information from other jurisdictions that have actually implemented sort of these consumer consumption lounges. And I think that part of what I was saying when I said I wanted to make sure that anything we did was respectful of the member cities restrictions would do exactly what I think you were basically saying, uh, Chairman Zuckett, which is this idea that for instance, a sensitivity for city of Coronado is different than the sensitivity for the city of National City. And so those are the types of things that should be taken into consideration. I'm hesitant um, to repeal the ordinance without having something else. And perhaps, um, you know, uh, our attorney uh, Russell could address this, but I'm a, a bit concerned about if we just repeal the ordinance, uh, does that mean that other ordinances of the member cities would then take precedence? Is there any issue that we have with respect to just repealing the ordinance without having something in its place? So that would be the question that I would uh, want to have answered before, um, you know, before, because my suggestion was that we would repeal the ordinance once there was another ordinance in place. Um, or at least, you know, that all, and that all of these issues would be addressed. So that that was what I had suggested. Um, understood. Well, Tom Russell, conveniently, you've got your hand up. So could you address Commissioner Moore and then whatever else you were going to say, please? 
Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, Commissioner Moore is is right on the, on uh, raising these questions. When we originally drafted our ordinance, what we were trying to do is to uh, make a deadline for having an ordinance in place or else we would have not been able to regulate this issue if it had been taken over by the state. So what we did is we uh, adopted an ordinance that prohibits cultivation. Now, nothing I've heard today uh, indicates that anybody wants to do cultivation. What they want to do is consumption. So actually, uh, absent our ordinance preempting the field, which means that we're not permitting consumption, um, the uh, the ordinance would not need to be repealed. So what I would respectfully suggest we be allowed to do is to come back with a further report before bringing a draft ordinance, but come back with a further report on how the ordinance might be amended to allow consumption and at the same time respect the individual member cities concerns, which vary. Some don't want that, some do. Um, and note that in the absence of an ordinance by us that occupies the field, uh, we would normally be subject to our uh, member cities ordinances. They are the ones that, that fill the gaps. When we regulate though, under our Port Act, we can preempt uh, city ordinances. So basically we'd like an opportunity if it's possible to come back uh, and, and give a further report before presenting a draft ordinance. And that, that further report would cover these questions of how the ordinance might be amended to allow consumption, how consumption could be allowed in a, in a way that would respect each individual member cities, and then also give us an opportunity for further communications with our colleagues in Oakland and San Francisco. You know, we have had some communications with Oakland and um, it's far from definitive what the position of state lands is on this. I, I saw a letter from them that indicated uh, concern over whether there was a sufficient visitor serving use shown. Uh, and yet, as I understand it, Oakland has permitted this. So uh, there may be unanswered questions there. And then, of course, there's the federal question, which uh, we don't have a, a final answer to. So, so with respect, uh, it would be uh, we would like to come back with a further report uh, on these possibilities before coming back with a specific uh, ordinance to sit uh, on this issue. OK, thank you very much, uh, General Counsel. Uh, just before I go to Commissioner Malcolm, Commissioner Naranjo, um, uh, you just heard Commissioner Moore and the General Counsel. Are you OK further morphing your motion consistent with that or not? Yes, that's that's totally fine. I think um, it would be great for that report to include to include that. And I know uh, mainly what we've heard, I mean, coming from the public comments um, about consumption, I, I still think it's good consideration on our legal analysis coming back. What what does it mean to uh, remove the prohibition of cultivation? I know the Port of Oakland allows for cultivation, so I think um, you know if we can have that come back next so we can have all information and answer all the questions that we have um, at our next meeting. OK, yeah. thank you very much. And I agree with that. Um, Commissioner Malcolm. Th thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to further address this only to, um, you know, provide a little bit of um, explanation because I find myself in a really difficult, you know, an unusual position for me um, going against, um, you know, the majority of the board. And I don't like to be there. Um, I, I don't like to be in this position. Um, and, and I want to assure um, Commissioner Naranjo um, and you, Mike, the seconder, that there is nothing personal in this. And, and I, I also understand, you know, where you're coming from in your position. Um, and, and Mike, you in particular made some really good points about you know trying to get information to answer some of these questions um you know however my objection and the reason why i'm going to be voting no on this is that the, the one thing you cannot answer actually there's two in my opinion but the one thing for sure is that you know right now this is an illegal substance federally under the under the controlled substances act and to me, that is a complete deal stopper right there. And the reason why 
is the Port of San Diego, and especially the Port of San Diego in particular, we are one of 17 strategic ports in the United States, and I have long argued the most important strategic port um, with the Pacific Fleet pivoting to San Diego. Um, our relationships with the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Customs, um, various different uh, areas of federal... Hold on. Dan? I, I, I'm sorry, I had a jet skier going by and they were blowing a horn at him. Um, no problem. Our, our relationships um, uh, are, are of vital importance for us. And um, I, I, I just believe that the answer of whether or not our security grants, uh, the money that we get from the federal government, I don't believe that our staff can give us any assurance 100% that those grants would not be imperiled. Um, or those relationships with those various different branches of federal government would be imperiled. So, so you know, and again, I just want to state that if if it was made legal federally, I would completely withdraw that objection. Um, and then, to your point, Commissioner Zuket, I would want to answer all of those other questions. But at this point, for me, that is just such a big deal. You, you know, the prospect of the port entering into a lease on tidelands, you know, for an illegal, federally legal use is just for me, you, you know, a, a showstopper, you know, but, but that's just my position on it. Um, but, but I certainly understand, you know, the board's position. Um, and again, to all the member cities and national city in particular, because you, you've you been well represented here today, I would not want the Port of San Diego to do anything at all to limit your ability in your jurisdiction to do, um, you know, what, what you want to, what you want to do, what rules you want to promulgate. This is specifically just an issue about port tidelands. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to provide that further explanation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I mean, first of all, I think this has been a really interesting uh, discussion today, and I've appreciated it. And Commissioner Malcolm, I, I know I don't, and I'm quite sure nobody else feels. Uh, that anything of what you're doing is personal. And in fact, I think you make some very good and important points. Um, and you may be right that there is nothing staff could say to, um, to change the sort of basic dynamic and the basic paradigm you're bringing. Um, and I think it's worth um, uh, doing it especially in the um, in the way the motion is currently structured which is which is to uh, bring back any and all information consistent with this entire discussion today so i'm interested to uh, still interested to see that but your points are very well taken um, as are those of commissioner benelli so with all that said just because the motion has um has changed a little bit. I'm going to ask uh, somebody. I assume it would be the general counsel or whomever would like to uh, to read back what uh, what you think the motion is, and then we'll ask Commissioner Naranjo if that's correct, and then we'll vote, please. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we started out with a motion to bring back a repeal of the port's ordinance, and I think Commissioner Naranjo graciously agreed to allow that to be amended to come back with a report that analyzes that uh, and comes up with uh, various options which respect uh, each member city at, at the same time uh, looks at the legality of uh, under federal law as, as, as was requested, looks at other cities, uh, comes up with essentially possible options for amendments to the ordinance uh, including repeal uh, and and allows and then presents those to the board for consideration and discussion. And then at a subsequent meeting following that, I would presume that the board would want to act uh, or we could set it out in the form of options for action at that at that moment uh, for the board to act uh, to to adopt an ordinance. Now, I know that when we you know, it took some time to go through and adopt the current, you know, prohibition on on cultivation. It didn't happen immediately. Uh, and we do ordinances, you know, of course, we like to reach out to the port tenants and so forth. Um, so uh, and I guess I would ask for some input here. So 
in terms of whether or not you would want this to come back in one step or in multiple steps. Um, well, I'll defer to Commissioner Ronho, but I think you're getting a little ahead of our of, of us. I think all we're talking about here is is step one, which is to come back with a report. What the what the board does at that point and what direction is given at that point is is whatever happens at that point. And the they may direct nothing. We may direct nothing. We may uh, direct the drafting of an ordinance, which would then come back or some other action. So I, I think um, unless I'm misunderstanding what you're saying, I, I think all we need is is the summary you just gave about uh, what staff is coming back with. Uh, Commissioner Naranjo, is that um, is that summary what you're thinking? Yes. That is exactly the summary what you just laid out and I think to your point chair what you said about uh, does it create the next steps like what Tom was saying about you know having a conversation with PTA that's going to be after we have the discussion and whatever direction we give but first and foremost what does that report look like what does that legal analysis look like that's going to be the first step and and giving that direction <clears throat> very good thank you I agree um, anybody else before we vote Commissioner Castellanos asked me to share that he had to step away, so I won't be calling him for the vote. Uh, please respond when I call your name. Commissioner Benelli? No. Commissioner Malcolm? No. Commissioner Moore? Yes. Naranjo? Yes. Zuket? Yes. Motion fails with Benelli and Malcolm voting no and Castellanos and Lassar excused. Very good. So that motion fails. Are there any other motions or anything else on this item from anybody? All righty. Uh, that moves us on to um, item 10 informational presentation regarding the San Diego Harbor Police Foundation. Good afternoon, Chair Zuket, Board Commissioners, President and CEO Stuyvesant, and Mr. Russell. By way of introduction and for the record, I'm Kirk Nichols, Assistant Chief of the Harbor Police Department, and it's my pleasure today to introduce two people from the San Diego Harbor Police Foundation. First of all, reintroducing Mr. Jeff Wohler, the President and CEO of the Harbor Police Foundation. And then joining us today for this informational presentation is uh, Board Director Sandy Mall of the Harbor Police Foundation as well. And she'll be providing an update on the foundation's efforts to date, as well as a, a new initiative in the realm of human trafficking that they're working on. And really, it's my pleasure to be able to do this. The foundation has been uh, huge uh, supporters and partners of the Harbor Police Department. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sandy for the presentation. Thank you, Assistant Chief, and thank you to the board. If we could advance to the next slide, please. As a charitable organization, the San Diego Harbor Police Foundation is proud of the contributions we've made toward creating safe communities and improving the lives of the children, families, and officers we serve. With the leadership of CEO Jeff Wohler and the guidance of Chief Stainbrook and our board of directors, we've continued creating stories of impact since our last briefing to you over a year ago. Next slide, please. The policing profession is one of the toughest in the world. That's why officer wellness has always been a huge priority for the foundation. While the COVID-19 pandemic sent much of the workforce home, our first responders stayed on the front lines. The foundation proudly provided over 5,000 meals to Harbor police officers and staff in 2020. We did this recognizing that a meal represents not only food for the body, but food for the soul. It communicated gratitude to those who continue to serve during one of the worst public health crises in history. The foundation's contributions are also evident at Harbor Police Headquarters. We converted an employee break room into a full-scale lounge now known as the Collision Space. Equipped with a new vending commercial coffee machine, a dining table, and armchairs, officers and staff now have a functional and comfortable space to recharge during the workday. Next slide, please. According to Officer Sophia Azuma, the Collision Space has created an intentional place for employees to stop and catch up with one another. Not only has it saved us money in purchasing treat drinks, but it has truly created a sense of community, a place where officers talk shop and build on our sense of teamwork and unity of purpose. Next slide, please. 
The foundation is also caring for the hardest working four-legged officers in the business, the K-19. This June, we upgraded the K-9 facility to include a new dog bath station, doggy drinking fountain, and storage shed. K-9 officers such as Bobby and Edgar are now enjoying refreshing baths after a long day of keeping travelers safe at the San Diego International Airport. Next slide, please. Another core foundation program is academic development for disadvantaged youth. Since 2019, the foundation has adopted Perkins K-8 school in Barrio Logan. Over 95% of enrolled students are socioeconomically disadvantaged and over 30% are homeless. These children require additional intervention to realize the quality of opportunity and lifelong success. To date, the foundation has upgraded four special education classrooms, re uh, replacing broken and dilapidated furniture with brand new furniture and equipment. Officer student mentorship continues with regular classroom visits from Harbor Police and outings such as Fish with a Cop and Shop with a Cop. Next slide, please. According to Perkins principal, Fernando Hernandez, the San Diego Harbor Police Foundation adopted Perkins School and has been instrumental in supporting a very vulnerable population. They have acquired specially designed classroom equipment for needy students, and most importantly, they have shown they care and our community feels it. Next slide, please. To build upon what we've done, we are introducing a holistic set of programs to help students continue raising academic performance and establishing viable career paths. Launching next month, Teachers Rule is a literacy program that will help second through fourth grade students bring their reading comprehension to standardized levels. As of January this year, only 40% of Perkins kindergarten students were on track to meet reading goals. Teachers Rule has over 50 volunteers signed up to date who will tutor students one-on-one. -on -one. It's also time to start preparing students for the workforce. Career Pathways is a student workplace exposure program designed for grades six through eight. Students will be transported on site to top employers such as Qualcomm, Gafcon, Solar Turbines, and the Manchester Grand Client. They will focus on tours, hands-on learning, and career panels that will help shape their career choices. Through our Parent Parent program, we'll host evening classes for parents on topics ranging from financial planning to life skills such as stress management and leadership. Through these programs, we truly believe we can change the trajectory of our disadvantaged youth from poverty to power and from helplessness to hope. Next slide, please. These photos depict shop at the cop and a visit to the school from Harvard police officers. Next slide, please. We're also working on Party with a Purpose, an event that will raise funds to purchase active learning equipment for four schools in the Fort Member Cities. The Intercontinental Hotel will host and has already committed 10000 towards Perkins School. Next slide, please. The last core program we'd like to highlight is Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention. The FBI has identified San Diego as one of the top 13 high-intensity child trafficking areas in the nation. To combat this crime, we need to attack it from both the law enforcement level and the community level. Under our Help Stop Human Trafficking program, the foundation has funded specialized training for 13 Harbor Police officers and senior staff, certifying them as human trafficking liaison officers. Today, the Port of San Diego Harbor Police now represents the country's largest contingent of human trafficking liaison officers within a single local law enforcement agency. We're very proud to help the Harbor Police lead the way nationally in the fight against trafficking. Next slide, please. The next phase of Help Stop Human Trafficking is a community-wide training and awareness program launching in Q3 or Q4 of this year. This program represents a collaboration between the Foundation, Harbor Police, and District Attorney Summer Steffen, a longtime champion in the fight against trafficking. We need to engage San Diego residents and employees as part of the solution, and to that end, we have produced a series of training videos that will be available for free to employers. They have special focus on the hospitality and tourism industries, whose employees have the highest probability of encountering trafficking activity. Those who complete the training will learn how to recognize the signs of human trafficking and report suspicious activity to law enforcement. These videos will be supplemented by a website, educational materials, a community outreach campaign, and advertising campaign that will roll out through 2022. And now we're very excited to share a sneak peek of a segment from our Help Stop Human Trafficking training video. We can roll the video, please. Human trafficking is modern day slavery. It's turning somebody into a product to simply use them to make money. The victims don't see a penny. Human trafficking in San Diego is huge. The second largest criminal industry behind the drug industry. The victims come across any one of us and we wouldn't even realize it. 
Human trafficking happens when a person, a trafficker, controls another person, a victim, and sells that victim to a buyer for money. The buyer uses and abuses the victim for sex or labor. These victims who are treated like objects for sale are men, women, and children, girls and boys. This crime of human trafficking is so despicable. It steals the body and the soul of people. I was 14 when I met my trafficker. Keelan Washington went to a mall in San Diego with friends and met a guy. Extremely charming. And gave him her number. Text messages led to phone calls, led to us meeting in person. He would take me on dates, buy me clothes, jewelry, and just shower me with affection. All lies. Eventually, he sold her for money to have sex with other men. When she said no, he beat her until she lost consciousness. He was telling me that I wasn't able to leave, that if I tried to leave, not only would he kill me, but he'd kill my mother too. I was sold all across the country. Victims of human trafficking, they're manipulated by their traffickers, and so they will not reach out to the police and report their trafficker, nor will they go up to someone and say, help me and save me. There are thousands of victims and traffickers among us in San Diego, in our airport, our hotels and motels, restaurants and bars. You are in a unique position to help stop human trafficking. People in the tourism industry will notice the subtle signs, those red flags, and they'll have a chance to be part of saving a life. If one person would have stood up for me, I would not have went through three years of slavery. Welcome to the training. Thank you for helping us stop human trafficking. I'm San Diego County District Attorney Summer Stephan. And I'm Chief Mark Stanbrook with the Port of San Diego Harbor Police. Because you On behalf of the leadership and board of the San Diego Harbor Police Foundation, thank you for your time and we look forward to contributing to public safety and community enrichment in the Port District for many years to come. And that concludes our community. Thank you very much for that presentation. We appreciate it. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers on this item? We do not have any public comment. Okay, and Commissioner Malcolm, you've got your hand raised, but I'm not sure if it's from the last item or if it is for this item. Th that is for the last item, but I really appreciate this item and the information. And thank Great. you to Mark Steenbrook. Thank you, and Commissioner Benelli. Yes, um, thank you uh, for the philanthropic work. Uh, the foundation really has an impact on a lot of people's lives. My question is, I realize we have a relatively small but dynamic force. And um, one of the things I've learned over the years in doing my phil uh, foundation work and philanthropic work is if um, we have a Harbor Police uh, Enforcement Officer hurt on the job, um, an accident or whatever, and they're seriously hurt and they need some rehabilitation, I know we cover a lot, uh, you know, the insurance, the medical insurance we have covers a lot of that. But one of the biggest parts I've always found with healing is bringing loved ones close to the injured person. Um, do you guys, does the foundation have the wherewithal, and I realize you have modest means as a foundation, to, to make sure that loved ones can stay close by while someone's recovering from uh, injury? Uh, yeah, nice to see you again, Commissioner. Uh, that, that's correct. We have provided that sort of service and will continue to do so. Wonderful. Thank you for all you do. You're welcome. Very good. So thank you very much for the presentation. This is an informational item, so there's no motion needed. Appreciate your time today. And Chief Stainbrook, uh, great job in the video as always. You are a you are a TV star in action, man. Um, well done.
See, this is why humor doesn't really fly on Zoom. But uh, anyway, Mark's laughing inside. OK, well, thank you very much. And we'll move on to item 11. So good afternoon, Chairs of Gate, Commissioners, President Steiner Saint, and General Counsel Russell. My name is Eileen Maher. I'm your Director of Environmental Conservation, including Aquaculture and Blue Tech. With me today is Amanda Russell, Sea Grant Fellow with Aquaculture and Blue Tech, and Heather Cramp, Associate Environmental Specialist with Environmental Conservation, and Simon Can with the General Counsel's Office. Today, staff will be requesting that the board enter into a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Department of Transportation Maritime Administration, or MARAD, to assess the potential for eelgrass to sequester carbon in the bay. In addition, we will also be requesting a budget amendment to increase the non-personnel budget by $110,000, which will be reimbursed with the funding from MARAD. So how do we get here? The port has been developing relationships with numerous organizations for years. While developing these relationships into formal partnerships, the port has continuously advocated for investment in our region and on tidelands for, for specific projects and policies. This advocacy has been delivered during board and staff legislative trips to Sacramento and Washington, D.C., public meetings, informal collaborations, comment letters, and letters of support. It's through these partnerships, including the one with MARAD, that we've been able to collectively raise awareness for more investment in our region's natural and built environment. What you will hear about today is another example of one of these partnerships and we appreciate the board's continued leadership in supporting these blue economy uh, initiatives as we continue to advance our relationships with these agencies who also share and have a vested interest in supporting the San Diego region and the environment. And with that, I will now turn it over to Amanda. Thank you, Eileen. Today, we will be discussing what blue carbon is and why it is important current initiatives at the port, and the planned San Diego Blue Carbon Eelgrass Study. This will be the first study of its kind. Blue carbon, as defined by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, is carbon captured by the world's ocean and coastal ecosystems. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the ocean can be captured through photosynthesis and converted to biomass or stored in the sediment, as shown by the picture on the lower left. Many marine ecosystems are highly effective at removing carbon dioxide in this way, including ecosystems of salt marshes, mangroves, and eelgrass. As seen by the graph on the lower right, these marine ecosystems can have annual sequestration rates several orders of magnitude higher than tropical forests. This infographic, designed by the Nature Conservancy, highlights some of the many reasons why blue carbon is a critically important resource. For example, small but mighty wetlands cover less than 1% of the ocean, but store over 50% of the ocean's carbon reserves, demonstrating the incredibly high efficiency of this ecosystem. Blue carbon also has the potential to mitigate effects of climate change by removing carbon dioxide a greenhouse gas directly from the atmosphere and the ocean. Globally, blue carbon sequestration in wetlands alone can offset the burning of 1 billion barrels of oil. Within San Diego Bay, there are many interdisciplinary benefits of blue carbon that support diverse projects across multiple departments. This includes the Environmental Conservation and Aquaculture and Blue Technology Departments through the protection and conservation of these ecosystems, the Maritime Clean Air Strategy and Climate Action Plan through the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions and removal of carbon dioxide, and policy and legislature priorities through coordination with local and statewide initiatives. To enhance and support these interdisciplinary benefits, the port has several current initiatives focused on building and growing our blue carbon knowledge. For example, beginning in 2020, staff began drafting an internal informational document for staff to learn about blue carbon ecosystems and their ability to sequester and store carbon. 
We also partnered with a graduate student from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies, Walden Kiker, to explore blue carbon markets and develop a potential framework for how a blue carbon offset project might be developed. Walden was also immensely helpful in setting up meetings and building connections with other agencies, researchers, and nonprofit organizations working on blue carbon and other nature-based solutions. One example to highlight these connections is that we're taking an active role in the newly formed California Blue Carbon Collaborative, which is facilitated by the nonprofit group Wild Coast, to align our research and policy efforts and develop regional blue carbon investment opportunities. And here I will hand the presentation over to Heather. Thank you, Amanda. So in order to maximize our blue carbon opportunities, we need to understand what blue carbon ecosystems we have in San Diego Bay and how much carbon they're storing right now and how much carbon they may sequester into the future. As you may know, San Diego Bay supports a lot of eelgrass habitat. We have roughly 17% of all eelgrass in the state and half of the eelgrass found in Southern California. We also have wetlands and uplands that contribute to carbon storage, but the greater eelgrass acreage compared to wetland acreage really makes eelgrass a heavy hitter when it comes to carbon storage, and San Diego is a little too far north to support mangrove forests. So in spring 2021, we partnered with a second graduate student from the Middlebury Institute, Trang Trin, to review scientific literature on the Bay's eelgrass and use calculations in the literature to estate, estimate how much carbon these habitats might be storing. What Trang found is that our eelgrass habitats may currently store over 132,000 metric tons of carbon, which is equal to the annual emissions of about 107,000 cars. On top of that, Trang estimated that each year our eelgrass beds continue to sequester and store carbon at a rate of 500 to 2,500 metric tons per year. So they're absorbing the annual emissions of approximately 1,000 cars each year. To put these numbers into context for you, the port emitted just under 400,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide in 2016. These data are a great baseline for us to begin understanding our blue carbon resources, and it'll help support recent state efforts on greenhouse gas emissions reduction and resource management that I'll talk about next. The state has recently engaged in efforts that include blue carbon. There's been a lot of movement, movement focused on nature-based solutions to climate change that staff have been following closely. You may be familiar with Governor Newsom's recent executive order establishing a 30 by 30 strategy with the goal to conserve 30% of the state's land and coastal waters by 2030. Staff have attended several public meetings, given public comment, and we submitted a comment letter focused on the unique role blue carbon ecosystems play in mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. And we recommended that coastal ecosystems and working seascapes be highlighted in the strategy. In parallel, the Air Resources Board is currently updating its natural and working lands inventory. This is a quantitative estimate of how much carbon is currently stored in all of California's lands. The inventory will be used to model how carbon storage will change over time, and CARB's done some preliminary modeling that suggests carbon storage will gradually decrease, so we'll need to develop strategies and land management practices that maximize storage potential. The goal is to change that trend, trend line to reach carbon neutrality. Important to note for the port, CARB does not currently plan to include eelgrass habitats in its natural and working lands inventory update because there's not currently enough data available to accurately assess how much carbon these habitats store. So this presents a great opportunity for us to collect much needed data to not only support our own climate planning efforts, but also provides an opportunity to make our case on state initiatives like the Natural and Working Lands Inventory Update. So to recap, we know that blue carbon has the potential to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. We know these ecosystems contribute a lot of environmental co-benefits, and we have an estimate of how much carbon the Bay's eelgrass habitats may be storing. But carbon storage in eelgrass ecosystems can vary widely based on geographic location and oceanographic conditions. In cases where eelgrass is impacted or degraded, they can actually release large amounts of carbon. So while our literature assessment of the Bay's carbon storage is useful, we need on the ground data if we're going to incorporate blue carbon into our planning efforts. As Eileen mentioned earlier, this baywide blue carbon study is founded on relationships we've built. 
In 2019, we worked with Wild Coast to develop this study. And then in early 2021, Merad connected with the port looking for a carbon sequestration project to partner on. Staff proposed the Blue Carbon Study and we're also collaborating with the US Navy on information sharing and logistical support. The study will collect eelgrass and sediment samples at 11 locations around the bay. The samples will then be analyzed for carbon content, and this will give us a picture of carbon storage across the bay. The study will also sample within historic eel beds, eelgrass beds, and these are beds that have been present in the bay for decades, and sample within newly restored eelgrass beds. And this will give us an idea of how historic versus restored beds compare and provide insight on how new restoration could support greenhouse gas mitigation efforts. The study will also create a standard for data collection that is verifiable and repeatable. And this is important because the port uses standardized and rigorous methods for inventorying greenhouse gas emissions now. And this study will comparatively assess carbon storage at a similar standard. Merid will provide $150,000 to support the first year of baseline data collection with the option to fund up to $500,000 to continue sampling over the next few years. Regular annual sampling would provide data on how carbon storage and sequestration rates are changing over time. We plan to share the study results with our partners to support state, regional, and local climate resiliency efforts. And again, this will be the first study of its kind in the state, and we're not aware of any other studies at this scale across the US. The Blue Carbon Eelgrass Study also ties in nicely to the port's growing portfolio of nature-based solutions projects. You're familiar with our Blue Economy Incubator projects, Econcrete, Sunken Seaweed, and San Diego Bay Aquaculture. We also have our Pond 20 Wetland Mitigation Bank, which is restoring coastal habitat that will also sequester carbon. Staff plan to assess carbon storage at Pond 20 as the project develops. And as you know, our Native Oyster Living Shoreline project was recently funded. Oyster reefs can prevent erosion and trap sediment that also leads to carbon sequestration. We also recently kicked off our restorative aquaculture planning effort funded by the Builders Initiative. Seaweed aquaculture has the potential to store significant amounts of carbon, and both seaweed and shellfish provide a slew of co-benefits that could support the development of nutrient trading programs. This aligns well with our partnership with NOAA's National Ocean Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, led by Dr. James Morris, who some of you had heard from during previous board presentations, to develop a map atlas for seaweed and shellfish aquaculture opportunities around San Diego Bay. We're proud of the partners and collaborators who've formed so far, and we're continuing to build on those relationships as blue carbon research and opportunities evolve. Moving on to our summary and recommendations, we're recommending the board accept grant funds from Merad to fund the San Diego Bay Blue Carbon Eelgrass Study. The Merad grant is a reimbursement program, so staff recommends the board adopt an ordinance to increase this fiscal year's budget by $110,000 for the Blue Carbon Study. The additional $40,000 provided by Merad will support staff time. This concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Do we have any public comment, Donna? Yes, we have one voicemail. We aren't hearing that, Sally, if it's playing. Okay, just one moment, please. I'm going to start it in just a moment.
OK, everyone, I'm so sorry. I'm having difficulty. I will. Try one more time. My name is Sri Kandare, speaking for Agenda Item 11, and I am a rising junior in high school. I have been volunteering with the San Diego Audubon since I was eight. And an avid birder, I have often visited San Diego's biodiverse lagoons, including some that support significant eelgrass populations. I am calling in support of the port's efforts to monitor, restore, and preserve eelgrass beds, as their benefits are extensive. Thank you for recognizing the ability for eelgrass beds to sequester carbon, ameliorate ocean acidification, and serve as an important part of several marine food chains. However, just yesterday, the UN Climate Report declared climate change as a code red for humanity. With sea level rise on the horizon, we need to act fast. As they require shallow waters for photosynthesis, eelgrass beds will be forced by sea level rise to move up toward the coast, where they can be blocked by barriers, including man-made ones. Therefore, it is imperative we preserve current seagrass beds while planning for the future. We hope that your work to survey eelgrass will help our community preserve these in invaluable parts of our ecosystem. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That concludes public comment. OK, thank you very much, Commissioner Malcolm. Thank you, Chair Zuket. And can I ask staff to put up the the slide um, uh, right near the end on the nature-based solutions uh, at the Port of San Diego? And while you're doing that, I want to thank staff for this report. Um, well, while staff is getting that up, um, I, I will tell you I, I am so excited about this item um, and, and about not only this murad grant um and studying blue carbon and eelgrass but just about the entire trend of the port of san diego looking at nature-based solutions to um, carbon sequestration car carbon emission um you know as staff i think indicated in the report we are on the leading edge of of these kinds of things not not just in the state certainly in the region in the state but in the country and that is exactly where the Port of San Diego should be. And, you know, this all started quite a few years ago when we started looking at aquaculture and it's just grown to now the Port of San Diego is a test bed for these kinds of out of the box um, studies, ideas, solutions. Um, you know, and I just want to remind everyone, unfortunately, I am old enough to remember um, being 10 years old and being in San Diego Bay when there was no eelgrass at all or virtually none and the bay was almost totally devoid of life you know so as we're studying blue carbon sequestration I also want to remind everyone that you know eelgrass is a definite indicator of the health of the bay and from 40 years ago to today it is like night and day what has happened in this bay you know and and that's a lot of good environmental rules. That is really a lot of, of, of good focus on nature-based issues. And I feel like now we are just on the cutting edge, uh, which is why I'm so excited. We've added thousands of acres. We filled the donut hole. We now control all the waters in San Diego Bay. And what an awesome template to have even other projects. You mentioned seaweed for carbon sequestration. You mentioned shellfish. I understand that oysters and mussels are excellent carbon sequesters as the shells grow and sequester carbon. Um, you know, and we have this huge amount of water area now that, that we can use for these kinds of programs and, and just how exciting that that is to have the, the ability and, and the area to do these programs. Um, I wanna mention Pond 20, you, you've got that here on, on, the, uh, on the visual. And Pond 20 is going to be an example, the first in the state, one of the first, I think maybe the first in the country for a port of actually restoring uh, what is environmentally dead land to the highest level, to wetlands, wetlands level, and actually 
making that environmental benefit also a financial economic benefit. You know, and that's the real key here, because if we can actually create a situation where doing these kinds of projects actually also create economic benefit, mm -hmm. I, I will say the sky is the absolute limit. Um, and I am just so supportive of these kinds of projects. Um, one question that I have for staff, you, you did mention it in the report, um, uh, seaweed, eelgrass, um, shellfish, you mentioned a little bit about mangroves, and I know mangroves are incredible blue carbon sequesterers. And I would just like a little bit of explanation of why mangroves, maybe somewhere down in the South Bay, why that would not be um, another viable study that we might look at. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. This is Heather. Um, historically, I don't believe there's any evidence that mangroves have ever existed in San Diego Bay. We're just a bit far north uh, geographically to support those ecosystems. Um, that, of course, might change with climate change, but currently we're not looking to put in an ecosystem that wasn't historically present in San Diego Bay, um, especially because we already have eelgrass beds and species that are um, habituated to the environment that's here. We don't want to change that and potentially impact those systems. That makes total sense. Appreciate the answer. Um, anyway, very, very excited about this. And at the appropriate time, uh, Mr. Chair, I would also like to, mo to make the motion to adopt the ordinance to accept the MURAD grant um, and the other staff recommendations. Thank you. And maybe that sounded kind of like a motion, but I'll leave that to I, you. I, I think it sounded like a motion, so we can we can keep the discussion going after you lay that on the table. Well, I'll just make it a motion. Fantastic. Uh, motion by Commissioner second. Malcolm. Commissioner, um, second by Commissioner Benelli and Commissioner Benelli, you're up next. Great, thank you. Just briefly, um, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the initiatives, Ms. Mayor, Ms. Russell, Ms. Cramp. Great, great work. When you consider all the, the development, all the growth we've had, as Commissioner Malcolm said over the years, these are wonderful initiatives to help our environment, to keep our bay clean. And if you consider just, uh, as I always point out to the folks in Coronado, when they look across the bay and they're worried about downtown San Diego, we're going to have another 100,000 people 70,000 jobs over the next 30 years in the Central Business District. And uh, everything we can do to uh, help the uh, ecosystem down there and restore it, uh, these are wonderful initiatives, and I s salute you for the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Bedelli. Um, okay, I second the comments of uh, both of my colleagues, in particular, uh, Commissioner Malcolm um, and his excitement about this. So good stuff. Thank you. And clerk, please call the roll. Thank you. Please vote when I call your name, Benelli. Benelli, yes. Malcolm? Yes. Moore? Yes. Naranjo? Yes. Duquette? Yes. Motion passes unanimously with Commissioners Castellanos and Lassar excused. Very good, thank you. Uh, that takes us to our last item, uh, the ever-present review and consideration of the draft agenda for next meeting. Uh, do we have any public comment to begin with? No, thank you. And I saw Commissioner Benelli leaning forward on his elbows move acceptance of the draft agenda and I do have a question after we vote on the ag draft agenda. Okay. Uh, that's a motion by Commissioner Benelli. I'll second it. Please call the roll. Thank you. Please vote when I call your name. Benelli. Benelli, yes. Malcolm. Yes. Moore. Yes. Naranjo. Yes. And Zuket. Yes. Motion passes unanimously with Commissioners Castellanos and Lysar excused. Thank you. Commissioner Benelli. Yes. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, based on what uh, President uh, Joe Stavison said, are we still holding the 23rd the stimulus workshop as a, as a potential hold date with the idea that if uh, uh, the state 
has to look at uh, the American Rescue Fund and stuff. That that date could slip. Go go ahead, Joe. Uh, yeah, Commissioner Medelli. Right now, we still plan to hold the twenty third, and still plan to do a virtual budget uh, workshop. It it'll be helpful for us to get out in front so that when things break loose, we're ready to go. Thank you. Okay, um, if there's nothing else, appreciate everybody's uh, participation today. Good meeting, thank you. And until next time, we are adjourned. Thank you, good night. Thank you.